Good morning. Welcome to our interdisciplinary symposium, Diversity in Small to Mid-Sized Museums. My name is Christy McMillan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. I'll be the program's moderator. The symposium is presented by the museum here in Asheville, North Carolina. Established by artists and incorporated in 1948, the museum is committed to being a vital force in community and individual development and to providing lifelong opportunities for education and enrichment through the visual arts. Our vision is to transform lives through art, and our mission is to engage, enlighten, and inspire individuals and enrich community through dynamic experiences in American art of the 20th and 21st centuries. Generous funding for the symposium was provided by the Henry Luce Foundation. The Luce Foundation seeks to enrich public discourse by promoting innovative scholarship, cultivating new leaders, and fostering international understanding. Established in 1936 by Henry R. Luce, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Time, Inc., the Luce Foundation advances its mission through grant-making and leadership programs in the fields of Asia, higher education, religion and theology, art, and public policy. A leader in arts funding in the United States, the Luce Foundation's American Art Program was established in 1982 to support museums, universities, and arts organizations in their efforts to advance the understanding and experience of American and Native American visual arts through research, exhibitions, publications, and collections projects. Just a few items to note before we get started. All microphones and video were muted by default this morning. If you'd like to turn on your video at any time, I'm sure that our speakers would welcome having faces to look at in the audience instead of names. Choose a quiet room and close the door. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. If you do turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, fan, or other strong source of light or movement as it makes it difficult for us to see you. While you can use uh, a smartphone to log in, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that as your comments and questions come in in the chat box, uh, we know who to direct them to. In order to ask questions or make comments throughout the program, please type those into the chat box. And finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video remains muted. We have a full agenda, uh, a full and exciting agenda for you today. Um, first, we will have our welcome from Pamela L. Myers, Executive Director of the Museum. Hilary Schroeder, our assistant curator, will then talk about the Loose Project and approach here at the museum and why today's uh, symposium is a perfect fit. Our keynote address will be given by Dr. Uh, Darren J. Waters, who is the executive director of community engagement and associate press professor of history at UNC Asheville. We then have four student papers, three from graduate students, which will be 15 minutes plus Q&A, and one undergraduate student, which will be 10 minutes plus Q&A. Uh, Dr. Waters and Hillary will then return for a response and Q&A, and then Hillary will give us a wrap up. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Pamela L. Myers, the Executive uh, Director of the Asheville Art Museum to welcome us this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pamela Myers. I'm director of the Asheville Art Museum, and I want to thank Christy for that perfect introduction. As an organization, the Asheville Art Museum is 70 years old. We're committed, as Christy said, to collecting American art of the 20th and 21st century and to interpreting it for our communities. We're committed to serving all of our communities to being a learning organization, to being equitable and transparent. We know we have more to do, as does the field of art museums as a whole. This symposium is part of our commitment to bringing new voices to the table to continue dialogue and promote change. I too would like to thank Terry Carbone, the program officer at the Henry Luce Foundation. For many years now, she has supported our approach to interpreting the collections that we hold in the public trust 
And as Hillary will tell you, she uh, helped us assemble a team of scholars from across the country uh, to, to bring more voices to the table in that endeavor. I'd also like to thank Christy McMillan for organizing today's symposium. Christy is our Director of Learning and Engagement uh, and leads our team here at the museum. Likewise, Hillary has been essential to the production of our Loose Foundation supported reinstallation and reinterpretation of the permanent collection and to the upcoming publication of the first ever uh, introduction to the collection in catalog form. I'd also like to thank all of the speakers who are with us today. Darren has been a member of the Loose uh, Interpretation team for several years, and I am just as excited as I can be to hear the voices of the students who have submitted papers to share with us today. I'd also like to thank all of you who are here joining us on this crisp autumn Saturday morning. So without further ado, I will turn it over uh, back to Christy to uh, continue along on the agenda. Or I think I'm introducing Hilary Schroeder. Yes, thank you so much, Pam. Um, Hilary is here to uh, talk to us about the Loose Project um, here at the Asheville Art Museum and uh, tie it into this morning's symposium. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am really thrilled that this symposium is happening today. It is sort of part of our, our coming full circle with this project uh, supported by the Henry Luce Foundation. I actually began my journey with the Asheville Art Museum in January of 2018 when I was brought on as the project coordinator for this grant um, and have really seen how a group of people have come together to have really interesting and important conversations. And I really feel that this is an extension of that today. So the Loose Project assembled a team of 12 um, scholars and professionals and artists from across varying fields, both regional to the Asheville area and nationally. Um, it included museum directors, uh, professors of history like Dr. Darren Waters, who joins us today, and even a former poet laureate of the state of North Carolina. And so the idea was to bring together a group of people with differing perspectives that some of them knew our collection well and others were coming to it with a fresh perspective and to really look at the way that the museum had been presenting its collection. Um, the project came together at the same time that the museum was undergoing construction and re-envisioning our building and spaces and so it seemed like the perfect time to really consider the stories that we tell in our galleries. And so one of the core ideas behind all of this in part because this is a core thing that the Loose um, Foundation supports is this idea of diversity. And so our reinstallation of the collection and the accompanying catalog that is currently in production was really concerned with telling a diverse story, not just in terms of media, um, as the museum certainly incorporates media of all kinds into our installation, uh, craft and painting and all of those other things. But, oh, and my lights are turning off. There we go. <laughs> Um, and, but also diverse perspectives and to really consider who was and wasn't being included um, in previous considerations of the collection. Um, and so this team really came in and guided us along that path. Um, and one of the things that was also a huge part of this conversation for us was the activities at Black Mountain College, which was an experimental um, school, liberal arts college in Black Mountain, North Carolina that ran from 1933 to 1957. That was also very forward thinking and progressive in its presentation of ideas and making and in inclusivity as well. Um, so that was a huge driving force behind some of the, the themes and conversations that guided our reinstallation of the collection. Um, and as one other element, um, we also had two diversity interns, um, uh, curatorial interns from Museum Diversity that we were able to bring on board during the course of this project. And these two individuals um, 
brought their unique perspectives and really explored ideas of diversity within the collection and um, were able to contribute to the catalog. So you will be able to read the contributions and writings and perspectives of Paper Buck and Michelle Lee, our two curatorial interns from Museum Diversity, when the catalog is available. Um, but as I mentioned, sort of at the beginning, we are here at this lovely full circle moment in which we can consider how diversity, especially in this time, um, is important in how small and mid-sized museums specifically function. And I'm really excited to hear from these innovative and forward-thinking undergraduate and graduate students who are bringing a new perspective that will be an excellent layer atop what we've already had so many conversations about um, through the Loose Foundation grant. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of hear what they have to say and hopefully have some conversation there during the Q&A at the end. So. I will let Christy take it from here. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, now we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Darren J. Waters as our keynote speaker. Dr. Waters is an associate professor of history and executive director of the Office for Community Engagement at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. As a member of the Department of History, he teaches courses in American history, North Carolina history, Appalachian history, African American, and Brazilian history. He also specializes in the history of race relations in both the United States and Latin America. Dr. Waters received his doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2012. His research focuses on the history of African Americans in Asheville and Western North Carolina. More recently, he has written about issues surrounding the construction of the nation's collective historical memory, exploring the impact of that memory on the present. In his role as the executive director of the Office of Community Engagement, he works closely with community leaders and organizations to strengthen old and build new partnerships for and with the university. For the past seven years, he has successfully organized seven major conferences on the history of African Americans in Western North Carolina and Southern Appalachia, the most recent of which took place yesterday in partnership with today's symposium. Dr. Waters is the creator, co-host, and executive producer of The Waters and Harvey Show, a weekly radio program and podcast that airs on Blue Ridge Public Radio. In 2018, Dr. Waters was awarded the Old North State Award by North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. Additionally, Governor Cooper recently appointed him to serve as a member of the North Carolina Historical Commission, the third oldest historical agency in the nation, and a member of North Carolina Arboretum Board of Directors. He was also a member of a special commission for the North Carolina Supreme Court. In spring 2020, Dr. Waters was named a faculty fellow for the William C. Friday Fellowship for Human Relations. During this and all presentations this morning, please add your questions to the chat box. There will be a few minutes following each presentation for Q&A, as well as final Q&A session after all presentations. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Darren Waters. Thank you so much, uh, Christy. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Pam and Hillary, for organizing this. It's so good to see you all today. Um, I see my good friends Richard and Judith here. Um, I want to say hello to them. I see Mary is here. Mary, is, it's good to see you as well. Willard is here. Willard is someone who I'm now getting to know because he is a member of the uh, the current class of fellows for the William Friday Fellowship of Human Relations. So it's good to see you all here. I, you know, I'll just confess, um, having to do this virtually is not my idea of, uh, of fun. In fact, Christy and I talked about this because the, the, the idea was to do this um, was to do this earlier this year, but when um, the pandemic hit and we had to uh, kind of rethink this, um, I was hoping that if we put it off, we would then get to uh, come together in person. 
Um, I, it's interesting. I'm a person of a divided mind because I've often said that books are my best friend. I love to spend time with my books in quiet, but I also realize that I love to just interact with people. So it's very difficult to know that I'm sitting here in my home, you're there, and we're not able to kind of just interact with each other in person. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. So <laughs> that yesterday, it was interesting with the conference yesterday of, of just trying to work through that. Uh, Christy, I want to say this is a little bit better because I can at least see some faces. Yesterday, the way that it was done, you couldn't see anybody. And it was just absolutely strange going through that. But anyway, I'm glad to be here. I have uh, enjoyed being able to work with uh, with Christy and Hillary and with Pam and all of the members of the Loose uh, Committee that they put together. Um, it was a really fun project. I am not an expert on art at all. I am a historian, but I have developed a deep appreciation for what um, museum curators do. Um, I've worked with this project. I've had the opportunity to work with the uh, Z. Smith Reynolds uh, Foundation on their public arts initiative uh, around diversity and inclusion in public art. And it has been a very rich uh, uh, learning experience. So I think it's in, in, in many ways is deepened um, my, I think, my knowledge of just how we can use history in very different ways. So uh, this has been this has been very fun um, to be involved uh, with this project. As I was thinking about this, you know, is where do you begin? I'm always challenged on where to begin with, with a talk. Um, and what I'd like to do, and this may seem strange in doing this, but I think it's going to make sense at the end, when we get closer to the end. Um, in my classes, my, my, my students have often been a little bit thrown off initially when I would pull out a scene from a recent movie. Um, I, I love sci-fi. As someone who grew up on comic books, I love comic books. Um, Marvel and uh, the Avengers, uh, all of those characters were some of my favorite um, comic books to read about when I was growing up. And it's interesting because th those, uh, the way that those uh, the comic books and the movies are done, they, they can be a rich commentary on where we are as a society. So recently, with the last um, movie of the Avengers series, uh, Avengers Endgame, I don't know how many of you may have had a chance to see this movie, but it was a very fun movie to watch. I, I've watched all of the series. Um, you're going to see in a minute why my sons actually hate going to the movies with me, because I'm always picking out something that they can learn something from, and they're looking at me going, hey, Dad, it's just a movie. Well, but if you've seen the movie Avengers Endgame, you kind of know the concept They're trying to go back in time to correct what the villain Thanos has done in the initial movie, uh, the uh, Infinity Wars. And so as the Avengers travel back, they're trying to collect these stones that will allow them to reverse this snap, you know, that that uh, that Thanos, the villain, has uh, has has done to to eliminate half of the universe. 50% of the people are beings in the universe have been eliminated just randomly through this snap. They're trying to reverse this. So they time travel and they try time travel and they pick up these stones before Thanos is able to get them and they bring them back to their present time. And they're going to use them to reverse the snap. They do this, but in doing this, Thanos is able to come through the time vortex and end up where they are, and he destroys their headquarters. It's, it's an amazing scene to just watch what happens. What is curious to me about this scene is that um, when when the Avengers kind of gather themselves, you got the Iron Man, Tony Stark, you got Captain America, and Thor, they're kind of looking out and trying to figure out what has happened. Character Captain America looks at Iron Man and he says, what just happened here? And Iron Man Tony Stark looks at him and says, we messed with time. And when you mess with time, time has a way of messing back. And I think this is interesting because of some of the conversations that we're going through right now. We're kind of playing with time, with history, and, and we're trying to, in some ways, rearrange narratives. This is where my work has kind of been uh, lately. So when we mess with time, will time mess back? That, that was a curious statement that he made. Then they walk up on Thanos and Thanos then makes a statement to them and he says, you know, um, you couldn't live with your own failure, referencing the initial movie, The Infinity Wars. You couldn't live with your own failure, so where does it bring you? It brings you back to me. 
And as someone who teaches the history of civil war and reconstruction, I find it interesting that we are, we are fascinated with this period of history. And you all know that we're dealing with this right now. Just think about right now in Pack Square, Vance Monument was covered up. We're dealing with this period of the, the American Civil War, the legacy of this war, and what has been in public art, you know, put across the, the landscape of, of the South in remembrance to this war. So we keep coming back to this period. And I've asked my class, why do we come back to this period? David Blight, a historian who I'll reference in a few minutes, has said that, well, he, he was quoting Robert Penn Warren when he said that the, the American Civil War kind of stands as, the, as an American oracle. We continue to come back to this period and why? In my mind, it's because there was a failure. There was a failure that precipitated this war. What was that failure is one of the questions that I will ask my students. And I have been curious to ask students lately, does America have a mission? And they find it hard to answer that question until we get to the end of the class. But if you think about our founding, founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution itself, I would argue that America at least thought that it had a mission. And we can argue about what that was and whether or not that was a good thing. But we keep coming back to this period. So they walk up on Thanos and he says, you couldn't live with your own failure. So where does it bring you? It brings you back to me. And then he says, you know, I just want to thank you. He said, because uh, he goes on to make this statement. He said, you know, um, you've made me realize that he said, I thought that by eliminating half of the universe that the other half would thrive. But I now see that I was wrong. So long as there are those who remember what was, there will always be those who can never accept what can be. They will resist. And Tony Stark looks at Thanos and he says, yes, we're all kinds of stubborn. And he says, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I've learned from this. So I'm going to take the stones that you have collected me. I will shred this universe down to its last atom. I will rebuild the universe teeming with new life that knows not what it has lost, but only what it has been given. And Captain America looks at him and he says, yes, but life born out of blood, but a universe born out of blood. And Thanos says, but they, they won't know because you won't be here to tell them. So I wanted to just lay that scene out because it's a, it's a very powerful scene to think about because there's a lot that is being said there. And especially when we are talking about revisiting old narratives and talking about trying to democratize or at least diversify the narratives, we're playing with time. And what will the response be? So just hold that scene in your head, and I'm going to try to come back to it. This search for an African-American past. Um, Hillary, I am going to try to, show, to uh, share my slides here. Um, and I'm hoping this is going to work. And okay, can you see that? You can see it. So, uh, well, Christy, I'm sorry, Christy, you're the one who's running the show here. Um, Christy and I talked and, and we talked about, okay, what would I title this if I gave this a title? Um, I am a, a, a real big fan of Krista Tippett. I love her show on being. And for some reason, as I thought about this and we're thinking about diversity in, uh, in, in small and mid-sized museums or just museums all together, uh, the title that came to me was On Seeing Representations of Oneself in Public Spaces. And, I'm, and, and in a minute, I, I will get to why that, that, that title kind of stood out to me. But I want to focus here for a few minutes on the African-American past, the search for an African-American past, um, because that's what brings this title to mind for me. One person I want to reference here early on is Carter G. Woodson. Some of you may who were uh, at the conference yesterday, and I know Richard and uh, Judith, you were there. Willard, you were there. Um, the first speaker was Dr. Um, Dr. Cicero Fain, and you heard uh, him reference Carter G. Woodson. And Carter G. Woodson is known, was known, and is still known today as the father of African American history. In 1916, he set out in the effort. He's the first, second African-American um, and the first African-American of slave descendants, um, of a descendant of slaves to get his PhD from Harvard University. Most of us know that the first African-American to get his uh, PhD from Harvard was, was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Carter G. Woodson was the second, born in Southern Appalachia. He would dedicate his life 
to the search for an African-American past are at least creating an African-American past. Woodson in 1916, when he set out to create what was known as, what is now known as the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, at the time that he founded it in 1916, it was known as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. He was told specifically when he went out to try to, to, to raise funds for this work, that African Americans did not have a history worth, stu worth studying. That was the response that he got. No history worth studying. But through his own efforts, he created this organization, which through its work has given us what we know now as Black History Month. He started it out as Black History Week. It became, it is now known as Black History Month in the month of February. And we still kind of commemorate uh, this every February. But Woodson is the one who gave us this. I'll probably talk about Woodson again shortly, but just thinking about that statement in 1916, that African-Americans did not have a history worth studying. And what that says, in a century, it's, a, it's an erasure. It is making a certain group of people invisible, or it is making them, pushing them to the margins. Let me come to, let me move to 19, to 2012, uh, just recently, not too long ago. Um, in 2012, I finished my, my doctoral dissertation. After I finished the dissertation, um, I had just finished it. Uh, the dissertation, as many of you know, is titled Life Beneath the, the Veneer, the Black Community in Asheville, North Carolina from 1793 to 1900. Um, I decided to take a trip across the state to visit places where significant stories related to the experiences of African-Americans in the state were known to have taken place. My interest in taking this trip was prompted by the deepening interest in the experiences of African-Americans, not just here in North Carolina, but across the country that my graduate studies had produced. And I'll say here yesterday, if, if you participated in the conference yesterday and you saw some of the presentations, the students' presentations were just, I thought, were marvelous. Uh, they did an absolutely fantastic job. And to know that early on that they have developed a deep sense, rich, rich sense of the African-Americans experience, not just here in this region of our state, but across the country, to me, it, it was, uh, was striking to my own experiences at that age. There were so many things that I did not know. It was really not until graduate school that I started deepening my knowledge in, of, of African-American history. I didn't get much of that in when I was in high school or middle school, not much in undergraduate school, but much more at the graduate level. So I thought yesterday, just listening to those presentations from the students was just marvelous to listen to. But my deepening appreciation and deepening interest in the African-American experience really came through my graduate studies. So I wanted in 2012, I wanted to know to what degree were those experiences, especially those that had not, that had had no small impact on the trajectory of the state's history, how were they commemorated? One particular story that interested me was the story of Harriet Jacobs. And I have Harriet Jacobs, a picture of Harriet Jacobs here. Harriet Jacobs, once a once enslaved girl who, after years of being sexually harassed by her owner, James Norcom, who was himself a prominent phys physician in Edenton, North Carolina, she bravely orchestrated her escape from slavery in 1842. Writing under the pseudonym Linda Brent, Jacobs published her story, the first former enslaved woman to do so in 1861. It's interesting uh, that she was the first one, first African-American woman who had been a slave to publish her narrative. Titled Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Jacobs' book, as one writer has noted, was an, elo was an eloquent and uncompromising story that did not shrink from discussing the sexual abuse of slaves are the anguish felt by slave mothers who faced the loss of their children. All the more striking was Jacob's vivid retelling of how for seven years she hid herself in a small crawl space under the roof of her grandmother's house in Edenton. As Jacob described it, the space was only nine feet by seven feet and only three feet at its highest point. In short, it was a small tight space. In her book about Jacobs, historian Jean Yelling describes the space as being no larger than a space underneath the library table. 
To say the least, it is a harrowing story in which Jacobs wrote that in order to get fresh air and light, she bored, small, bored some small holes into the roof of the attic. Although she would come out of the space for a few brief minutes at night, the impossibility of, of bodily exercise call health, caused health problems that she would suffer from for the remainder of her life. Um, although this is just a brief description of Jacob's story, if you haven't read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, I strongly encourage you to, to read the book. It is a fascinating story to read. Um, Although this is just a brief description of a life, some may no doubt recognize that her story, especially the story of her being hidden away in a small attic, bears striking resemblance, uh, similarities at least, to the story of Anne Frank, the young Jewish girl who chronicled hers and her family's life in hiding during the German occupation of the Netherlands during World War II. What is interesting to me about this story and comparing it to Anne Frank is I have been in audiences before, and I know Willard is here. Willard has heard me talk about this before just recently in the recent convening of the Friday Fellows. I've done this in audiences before, and I will ask the question, and this is not just in audience audiences that are predominantly white, but also in audiences that are largely African-American. I will ask the question, who is familiar with the name Anne Frank? And almost all the time, you get very few people, if any, who know the story of Harriet Jacobs. But if you say in either white audiences or black audiences, do you know, are you familiar with the story of Anne Frank? Normally, almost all hands go up. We know this story. This is interesting. I mean, just to think about. We know one story, which there's striking similarities, but to think that Harriet Jacobs had done this years before this same uh, similar incident with Anne Frank had, had happened, but we do not know Har Harriet Jacobs' story. So hold that in your mind for just a few minutes. In addition to my growing interest in developing a deeper knowledge of the role of African Americans in, sh in shaping in the shaping of the past, the pa and past key and important historical events, this last fact about our knowing Anne Frank's story but not being familiar with Harriet Jacobs' story, um, this fact is you know to me is just uh, is one reason why I took this trip in 2012. I was curious to see if and how people like Harriet Jacobs were remembered, especially in public art, such as statuary and other historical markets, markers in the towns or locales where they and the key events surrounding their lives had unfolded. So I went to Edenton, this, took, this trip took me to Edenton. In some ways, I was not overly surprised to discover that in the case of Jacobs, that there was virtually no substantial markers commemorating the life of this remarkable woman in Edenton. Aside from a historical marker that was erected by the North Carolina Highway Historical Marker Commission, a Historical Marker Advisory Committee in 1996, a committee on which I later, later served, there were no other markers of note about Harriet. And I have a picture of that marker here. In short, Unlike the case of Frank, many of the landmarks connected with Harriet's life no longer stand, They're not there. As for the historical marker, which you can see here, which was erect, erected again in 1996, let me just say that I was not all that thrilled with the wording, which, which, uh, with the wording, which reads, as you can see, fugitive slave, writer, and abolitionist. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, published in 1861, depicts her early life, lived in Edenton. Now, having served on this committee, I know that you're limited in the words that you can put. I mean, we now, you know, they put more words on these markers than they did probably at the time that this one was erected in 1996. But I find the wording somewhat interesting, and I'm sure that if it, we were to revisit this, if that, if that committee were to revisit, they may write this a little bit different. For one thing, the word I argue, and, and many of us now argue, use of the word slave instead of enslaved woman or enslaved person casts a dehumanizing shadow on her memory. It really does. So I, for one thing, I 
you know, I don't use the word slave that much because it is very dehumanizing. Words really mean things. And may I say a word here a few, uh, about uh, other markers um, that that I found in in this in the city of Edenton because in 1831, after the uh, Nat Turner uh, revolt in in Virginia, I mean there was heightened anxiety in Edenton in Choan Choan County, and so there's a marker that talks about that um, about the fact that that some people who are some enslaved people who were accused of maybe trying to plot a similar rebellion there were actually caught. But the marker that refers to this refers to all of these people who were caught as culprits. And this to me projects a, a, a certain image of people going into the future as well. So looking for Harriet, I decide to, you know, to really, you know, is there anything here um, I, to others, to other people may have, who may have been involved in her life? So out of curiosity, I did visit the grounds of the historic St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which I have a picture of here. If you go to Eden, Edenton is really a lovely town to visit. I mean, very picturesque if you go. So I went to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Edenton, North Carolina. And located not far, it's located not far from the center of town. It's right in town. And noted that James Norcom, who had tortured, who really the, the slave owner who had tortured Harriet for most of her early life, um, that his grave, as you see here, was clearly marked with a prominent headstone, no doubt placed there by, uh, by his family. And you can hear, if you look to the side, you can see the Norcom name there. It's a very prominent headstone that is there. But again, comparing that curiously to the lack of really any markers or anything substantial, no street names or anything to Harriet Jacobs. Also, I took a trip just to walk around town. And then you can see that right in the center of town, there is a marker to the Confederacy. Aside from making note of the headstone that Mark Nokram's grave, I also took, uh, I took note of the fact that located right in the center of town square was a prominent Confederate monument placed there in 1904 to honor the Confederate dead of Choan County. So essentially what I found in the town was an invisibility of African-Americans, of Harriet, this one small marker. No street names for African Americans. There is one street name uh, in, and I find this is a topic for another time, that in so many of these cities where you have significant events that occurred around African Americans' uh, lives who lived in these places, you find no real uh, references to them. But it was curious to see that there was a street named in Eatonton for, for Martin Luther King. And I find, I find that very interesting given the fact that Dr. King did not live in Edenton, you know, uh, argument that I have made uh, with regard to how we remember things even here in, in Asheville. Edenton is not the only place where the story of African Americans seemed to be either invisible or marginalized. In fact, it prompted me to later write a short essay that was published in the Mountain Express in 2014 entitled, Whose Story Democratizing America's Collective Historical Memory? I stated, uh, I stated that as I started the essay by referencing the work of Yale historian David Blight. Many of you will be familiar with David Blight's work. David's one of my favorite historians. Uh, Dr. Harvey and I had the opportunity to interview him on the Waters and Harvey show, and it was just a wonderful um, interview with David. David's most recent book on Frederick Douglass, uh, some of you may have seen entitled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, uh, was the winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 2019. And I think David is going to be doing a webinar sometime here soon. Um, uh, and I just got an invitation about that not too long ago. And I, I'll mention here that they, I have been accused of being by one of my colleagues at the university of being a David Blight groupie. But David is one of my favorite, one of my favorite historians. But I ref began my essay by referencing David Blight's work. And I, read, and I said that in his book, Race and Reunion, which is another book that I would strongly suggest if you have not had a chance to read that you read, but it's entitled Race and Reunion, the Civil War in American Memory. Blight stated that how a society remembers it pa is past. 
And I would like to add here, especially for the purposes for which this symposium is organized and thinks about um, how a society thinks about and represents its presence, a function which museums serve is a good indication of how the people of that society are of those societies see themselves. Reflecting on the issue of the Civil War and Civil War memory, Blight notes that in the case of the Civil War, especially early on, African Americans were virtually, virtually ignored as the nation constructed its collective memory of that period. He noted, for example, that at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, there was no mention of the role that slavery had played in the conflict. Instead, the events held to commemorate that occasion focused on the extent to which the nation had healed the sectional divide that had precipitated the war, which, let me go here, this picture I think perfectly illustrates. This is a picture from that event, that 50th anniversary, and you see former Confederates and former Union uh, mem members of the Union Army shaking hands across the divide, but it, the emphasis at the 50th anniversary was really on how the nation had healed the sectional divide that had precipitated the war. Unfortunately, most failed. I chose not to see that national healing had come at the expense of justice for African Americans. And I'd like to go back to the picture just before this, because some of you may have seen this picture before. This is a picture of Patton Avenue, and I don't know the exact date uh, that this photograph was taken, but you can clearly see it may have been in the 50s. Um, Pam may know, I'm sure that Pam has seen this, but the picture is curious because it's, if you look at the picture really, really close, you see people who are walking on the sidewalk, but if you have to look at the picture very closely, you will see the images of two men of two African-American men who are almost invisible. They're almost ghost-like in, in the photograph. And for me, in many ways, this kind of really depicts the uh, really how we have remembered the experiences of African-Americans throughout this country and other people of color as we think about the issue of diversity. But this picture kind of perfectly illustrates that for me. So I wanted to put this picture in. I've always found this picture fascinating. But going back to the 50th anniversary of, um, of the Battle of Gettysburg and recognizing that they wanted to talk about national healing, but to do it at the expense of justice for African Americans. Instead, of, instead, what was remembered, instead, what was remembered was either how the North had saved the Union or, in the case of the South, how Southerners had fought valiantly for their own freedom and independence, or, as some of the later Southern agrarian writers would argue, who I just recently read, um, they were fighting to maintain the agrarian way of life. To further explore the injustices, of Af the injustices that African Americans and other people of color would experience over the course of the 20th century would take up too much time in this time that we don't have. However, we kind of know the story. Jim Crow segregation, so forth and so on. However, I would say it is important to understand that those injustices included their marginalization in the narrative, our narratives that we have told ourselves about who we are and have been as a nation. In my opinion, this, when looking back over our history, is nowhere better illustrated than in a commemorative event that was held by former Confederates and Union uh, soldiers in Georgia in 1900. So, you know, as David tells and other people who focus on this period of history after the Civil War, there would be these blue-gray events that people would come together. One was held in Atlanta, Georgia in 1900. And I have a picture here of John, of John B. Gordon, who was one of a former, the former Confederate general who was was at Appomattox when um, when Lee surrendered to Grant. Um, in fact, Gordon was uh, responsible for stacking the weapons at Appomattox, would later become governor of Georgia, was also the head of the KKK in Georgia. Um, jo Gordon was at that event in 1900. And one union officer who was there um, named Shaw, Robert Shaw, not the same Shaw with the 54th uh, Massachusetts, but this is a different Robert Shaw, was there. And he got up at this event 
And he went into this long speech about how Southerners, at this time, Southerners were really working to construct this, this narrative of the lost cause narrative of the South. And so Shaw got up and he actually criticized the construction of this narrative in the South. And he said the Southerners were wrong, that Southern uh, were wrong in trying to construct the narrative that was not necessarily true. Well, Gordon got up and ve vehemently, vehemently objected to this, this saying that they were wrong. And this is the statement that he made in response to Shaw. He said, when he tells me and my Southern comrades that teaching our children that the cause for which we fought and our comrades died is all wrong, I must earnestly protest. In the name of the future manhood of the South, I protest. What are we to teach them, he asked rhetorically. If we cannot teach them that their fathers were right, it follows that those Southern children must be taught that they were wrong. I never will be ready to have my children taught that, that they were wrong, he said. I never will be ready to have my children taught that I was ever wrong or that the cause for which my people uh, fought, that the cause of my people was unjust or uh, unholy. Oh, my friends, you were right, but we were right too. So essentially, Everybody was right here. So you can see that through this statement, you're further marginalizing a story. I tell the story because we know, we all know the narratives that Gordon and his comrades and his supporters and their supporters, i.e. the, the um, United Confederate Veterans Association, which fought vigorously to control the writing of school textbooks in the South and the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was responsible for the installation of many of the monuments that are at the heart of so much debate right now has had a lasting impact on how our landscape, uh, not only on our landscape, but on the social order, on our social order as well. This narrative is the source of much tension here locally and across the state and the region. And I never would have thought that I would find myself right in the middle of so many of these conversations right now. The governor, of, as, um, as Christy pointed out, appointed me to the state's North Carolina Historical Commission just last year. Many of you uh, in the re most recent protests probably know that the governor made the decision to go ahead and remove the Confederate monuments from, from um, three Confederate monuments from Union Square in Raleigh, simply because the commission, and this was before I got on the commission, just stalled um, in making any recommendations as to what would happen with them. We they were supposed to be considering it. I've seen some of the proposals, but people are so locked um, to tie to this this uh, history and this story that they were un they could you know they were just kind of frozen in making any type of decision. Um, the governor removed them out of uh, safety reasons and has now charged the commission with finding a place to uh, finding something to do with those monuments. I have been joking to some of my friends, you can make this easy uh, on us by taking them. So if anybody in here wants the monuments, well, you know, we can talk after, after this is over. But, but, the, the, but this is, you know, I never thought that I would find myself in the middle of these conversations, that the special commission that I was serving on for the state Supreme Court was around the artwork that is in uh, the Supreme Court, the portraits of former justices. There's a life-size portrait of one justice of, um, of Thomas Ruffin, who was notorious for the decisions that he made around slavery, a slaveholder himself that sits right in the middle of the Supreme Court uh, of the courtroom, which the current chief, the ju chief justice has to come and sit in front of. I mean, it is a huge portrait. And really, they wanted us to come up with a policy to help them come up with a policy as to what to do, because the portrait needs to be removed. And um, that was an interesting experience. The commission, I think, just wrapped up. It, the commission did just wrap up its work. And as far as I was concerned, it, the, the commission really was a failure because I disagreed with the final outcomes of that. But these are ongoing conversations, that we, as we know, that we're having right here locally and, and across the region. But as you know, to make, but I want to make the point, but it is not just here in the South where we are witnessing rising tensions over historical narratives and public representations of those narratives. Traditionally, and in many ways still, America, Americans, both in the North, the South, and the West, have and remain more inclined towards what the great Southern writer Robert Penn Warren called a triumphantless narrative of American history. 
In other words, we want a clean story, one devoid of any representations that calls that clean story into, into question. Referencing this, uh, this idea in his book, American Oracle, which I'd mentioned earlier, American Oracle, the Civil War in the Civil Rights Era, David Blight writes that the favorite American conception of the nation's history, a story of uniqueness, special or divine destiny and progress has had, and I would add, um, add continues to have countless advocates of all kinds. Donald Trump's recent speech advocating the teaching of what he called patriotic education is a case in point. If some of you saw that speech, which he did at the uh, National Archives, I mean, which was really interesting. Um, and he talked about some of the things that we've been doing, like critical race theory and uh, the 1619 Project, which I'll, I'll argue that there are some flaws in the 1619 Project, but in all, it is a it's a project that I think that needed to be put out there. Um, it, and then when we think about what happens within the academy uh, with critical race theory, he criticized that and said that it was toxic and that it was brainwashing people. So it was an interesting speech that he gave. But so this idea of, of a triumphantless narrative of our history, you know, this uh, it still has major advocates. David went on to say in his book, uh, American Oracle, he said, in blessed redemptive America, the order of time as the master grand narrative of the 19th century George Bancroft put it, brings us a persistent and healthy progress. In this enduring vision, the United States was born essentially perfect and then began a career of improvement. No missteps, no backsliding. By and large, this has been the narrative that many of our nation's museums, both large and small, have until recently curated. And I would say here, think about the Smithsonian itself. Yesterday, some of you who uh, were attended the African Americans in Western North Carolina Southern Appalachia Symposium got to hear the last speaker, uh, Mr. Ryan Carson, who is now the vice chair of the 400 year commission. And he's chairing, co-chairing that commission with Lonnie Bunch, who is the uh, secretary of the Smithsonian. And many of you know, uh, and Christy and I talked about this recently that Lonnie uh, was really the person who spearheaded the work to, uh, to build, to develop and build the uh, African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, DC. But it's interesting because that was a 100 year project because it was a it was it was a former African American um, uh, Union show soldiers who 100 years before this museum was opened who called for it. That is a whole history itself to look at the politics of that and how it played out. One of the people who who really was instrumental in preventing it from happening in, in the 1980s and 1990s was our own Senator from North Carolina, Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms made sure that, that this was, was a project that did not get, um, that did not see the light of day during the time that he served in the United States Senate. All you have to do is just go back and look at the record. And one of the things that he actually said, he said, well, if you give African-Americans or black people a museum, then other people are gonna want one. Native Americans will want one and other groups will want one. This, we want a clean story. We don't wanna kinda uh, mess up this narrative that we've had. So if you're interested, you can read the, the, uh, about that history of the, the development of the African American Museum of History and Culture. But in, as I look at it, by and large, th this narrative that the nation's museums has really told, has curated this one that, um, that, that Blight references in his book, American Oracle, that America was born essentially perfect and you know, has this healthy pop, um, uh, progress, born essentially perfect and then began a career of improvement. This narrative, it is a story that lacks true diversity. And then I say true diversity because in a, in a way, diversity has been present in the narratives. For instance, and here I have a statue of Theodore Roosevelt that is at the American Museum of National uh, Natural History in New York. And I think, for instance, this statue, the statue of Theodore Roosevelt that once welcomed visitors at the American Museum of Natural History in New York is a case in point. Nevertheless, the representations, so you see diversity in this because there is the African man and there's the Native American. So there's diversity there. 
but the representations of that diversity has been skewed in such a way as to suggest that America's mission, which, had, which was seen as being rooted primarily in an Anglo-Saxon heritage, was to bring civilization to a world of largely uncivilized peoples. And that's essentially what this, this uh, monument really represented. In addition to the Roosevelt statue, which depicts, which, which has, has been removed, if any of you have been following that, it has been removed. But in addition to the Roosevelt statue, which depicts a triumphant Roosevelt on horseback flanked by a Native American man and an African man, Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, is indicative of this outlook and perspective as well. Writing in, in uh, 1899, the poem essentially lent support to Western and especially American imperialism. And here's just a few words from the poem if you haven't read it. Take up the white man's burden, send forth, your, send forth the best ye breed. Go send your sons to exile to serve your captives' needs. Senator Albert, Albert Breverich, who I've taught in my American uh, history classes, also his 1898 speech titled The American Flag is another example of this kind of the white man's burden or uh, bringing civilization to an uncivilized world. And just a quote from that speech, one place where he said, uh, the people who oppose this idea of America becoming an imperialist power and having colonies, think about the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, these are a darker complected people. And there's a major debate that takes place in the United States Congress about what do we do with these peoples? And so Be Breveridge, a uh, senator from Indiana in his, 19, in his 1898 speech, The March of the Flag said this, the opposition tells us that we ought not to govern a people without their consent. I answer the rule of liberty that all the rule of liberty that all just governments derives its authority, its authority from the consent of the governed applies only to those who are capable of self-government. Now, I've written an essay that looks at the early history of uh, the YMI, um, and it was about this issue of self-government. Did African-Americans have the ability to self-govern themselves? And this was a part of that project. But this is what he says. I answered the rule of liberty, the rule of liberty that all just governments derives its authority from the consent of the government governed applies only to those who are capable of self-government. We governed the Indians without their consent. We governed our territories without their consent. We govern our children without their consent. How do they know that our government would be without their consent? Would not the people of the Philippines prefer a just, humane, civilizing government of this republic to the savage, bloody rule of pillage and extortion from which we have rescued them? That's Senator Albert Breverich, 1898. Until recently, this theme has dominated our national narratives. However, as we all know, changing attitudes, which has been significantly influenced by the demographic shifts in our, our, our country is going, undergoing, and by new research, is now calling the truth and accuracy of this narrative into question. Indeed, it has given rise to conversations and discussions like the one occurring here this morning. As I thought about the words I might offer here today, I could not help but think about conversations, some in which I've been able to participate, that many groups, many people in groups and organizations are having about the need to rebuild a sense of community. Indeed, data has shown for years that our sense of community is flagging. In addition to the leadership and staff here at the Asheville Museum, another key organization that has been active in this conversation about community and the need to rebuild our shared sense of community is the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. In a statewide listening tour that the foundation took a few years ago, an initiative that was called the Visionary Idea Strategy Project, three dominant themes emerged from those conversations across the state. One, the foundation's leaders found that throughout the state, people felt that our communities are fractured and disconnected. Two, they found that the people, that people, they found that people felt that as a state and nation, we do not discuss race and structural racism openly. And three, they found that, that people throughout the state believed that our shifting racial demographics means that we need to find ways to build bridges rather than walls between us. As I see it, museums, both large and small, 
in museum spaces, be they indoors or outdoors, because our public spaces are in a way museums can and must play a fundamental role in helping in uh, in helping us to one facilitate facilitate hard conversations, two build bridges that divide build uh, build bridges to the um, bridge uh, to bridge the divides that many that, that may now separate us that may now separ separate us and three rebuild a sense of shared community among us on the first on the on the first point which is key to getting to uh, to the other uh, to which is key to getting to the other two museums that is the people who lead and oversee them must be willing to challenge or confront our proclivity for tri triumphantless telling of our collective story be it local state or national not all stories fit into such a narrative thinking back to that 2014 essay i wrote i had the observation i made the observation that the marginalization or better yet invisibility of the african american story at the 50th anniversary of the battle of, at gettysburg which included speeches by the then president by then president woodrow wilson is indicative of how we think about the american past in general i noted that at the i noted at that time in 2014 that is Nothing illustrated this better than the reaction to the unveiling of a memorial to Denmark VC, a former enslaved man in Charleston, South Carolina that year. And I have a, uh, an image of that uh, memorial in Charleston here. For those familiar with VC's story, he along with 35 other enslaved people were executed for allegedly plotting uh, a slave revolt in 1822. It goes without saying that this fact did not ensure him an honored place in Charleston nor American history. However, in 2014, and after years of planning and fundraising, a statue of VC was placed in Charleston's Liberty Square. The monument, which depicts VC standing erect and dignified, drew criticism the, criticism the moment plans for its construction were announced. Opponents argue that the city of Charleston should not memorialize a man in their opinion, a, a man who in their opinion was no different from a modern day terrorist. Because of VC's alleged plot included a plan to execute those who had enslaved him, his efforts, opponents of the statue argued, should not be celebrated. Writing for the Charleston newspaper, the Charleston city paper, Jack Hunter compared VC to Osama bin Laden, saying that the statue to honor VC is tantamount to admitting that terrorism is sometimes justified, end quote. In the context of what I call the politics of historical memory, opposition to this VC statue is not surprising. However, comparing VC to bin Laden is outrageous, particularly considering how integral terrorism was to the maintenance, to the maintenance of slavery itself. No one more vividly illustrated this than J. Hector John uh, de, de Quercourt, a native of France who, tra who settled in America during the colonial period. I have a copy of his book here. Some of you may have read this book. It's an interesting book to read. But in his book, Letters from an American Farmer, de Quercourt, who toured the South in 1782, described seeing an enslaved man who, who for the crime of murdering his abusive, abusive overseer, was imprisoned in a cage in the middle of an open field. The cage, he noted, was suspended in trees, and according to de Quercourt, birds of prey had begun feeding on the man. Now, I won't go into any more detail about what he describes there because it's rather gruesome, but it's interesting to read. Uttering what de Quercourt described as inarticulate monosyllables, the imprisoned man asked first for water and then for, for, for poison to end his life. Humanity herself, de Quercourt wrote, would have recall, recoiled in horror and noted that the image had left him arrested with the power of a fright and terror. Questioned by the Queer of Corps, the owner of the condemned man replied that the laws of self-preservation rendered such ex executions necessary. This was the world that Denmark VC inhabited, a world that left him and all other enslaved people with few options concerning their freedom. Commenting on the controversy concerning the VC statue, Douglas Egerton notes that even though VC's plan included violence, branding him a terrorist, 
merely demonstrates how little we as a culture understand about slavery and what it forced the men and women it is snared to do. After a presentation that Egerton, Egerton gave uh, on VC in Charleston a few years ago, and I think it's worth noting here as we look at this statue of Denmark VC again, that VC was also a founding, he was one of the founding members of Mother Emanuel, the AME church where white supremacist Dylan Roof killed nine parishioners in 2015. VC was one of the founding members of that church. Um, but after e Egerton's uh, presentation on VC, a troubled audience member asked, why not, why not work within the system for liberation? I stage a march. That was the question that came back about, uh, about VC's plan. But the reality is, is there was no system for VC to work within. He could not vote and even the freedom he had purchased because he had purchased his own freedom was still heavily subjected to the whims of the white power structure. As Edgerton noted, for the enslaved, the only path to freedom was to sharpen the sword. As I wrote in 2014, Egerton's analysis, though sound, could be taken a step further. America continues to have a difficult time facing its past, especially when this requires taking an in-depth look at subjects like slavery and other subjects. We could look at Native Americans, we could look at uh, Hispanic Americans, our Latinx, uh, what was going on in the West with, uh, with Native Americans and in the Southwest with, uh, with uh, Latinx, people of Latinx descent. We could also look in the Far West and look at what was going on with the Chinese. Um, it's not just a, a black-white dichotomy here, but there are others that we could look, um, stories that we could look at that we have a hard time looking at. But focusing on slavery, just for, the, for the, our purposes here, slavery, and, um, and we could add the segregation that follow it, followed it, does not comport with our claims about our founding ideals. Thus, when, when memorializing the past, and even in some instances talking about the, presence, the present, Americans are more comfortable with either illusions or images that do not glaringly highlight the country's, the country's hypocrisy. VC's story and the statue that now memorializes him does just that. And you could say, in some ways, the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter mural that is on uh, it, that is now in Pack Square, essentially does the same thing. That's why there's so much opposition to these type of um, this type of artwork. And I think that Co Councilwoman Shanika Smith, you know, w uh, spoke very eloquently about the challenges that uh, she faced in just doing that project and the opposition that has arisen. But VC story and the statue that now memorialize him do just that. It stands as a constant reminder of the cons inconsistent way we've attempted to live up to our democratic ideals. Now, I recently uh, read a story in the uh, last month's Atlantic Monthly, which was similar to the experience I did back in 2012, but I have a copy of that here, uh, last month's issue, of the September issue of The Atlantic call, and it's titled, How Did we It Come to This? But there's an article, a really good article, and if you don't have a copy of this, I, I suggest reading it, but a really interesting article um, by one man called Looking for Frederick Douglass. He took his family on a trip in search of Frederick Douglass, and, and it's similar to what uh, the story that I tell about my, my attempt to find Harriet Jacobson in 2012. Perhaps the desire, the desire to not be reminded of this, uh, in thinking about VC and these other stories like slavery, um, a fact that visitors to some museums like the Whitney Plantation in, in uh, Louisiana, um, makes, uh, which makes it a point of privileging the story of the enslaved, people have expressed being uncomfortable with this. This is not what they want to see. Um, and why there's so, and maybe that is the reason why there's so little visibility of these stories, a story like Harriet Jacobs in Edenton are having to really search hard to find people like Frederick Douglass. And I talk about as, as, as a recent, as, as the recent upheavals around the legacy of the Civil War and Civil War statues suggest, we are bound as a community, state and the nation to deal with these stories, stories of tragedy and of national failure. And here I would just quote what uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Bruce Springsteen of all people. And Bruce Springsteen once said, the past is never the past, it is always present. 
and we better reckon with it in our lives and in our daily experience or it will get you. It will get you really bad. And we've seen that, our inability to really confront and to really deal with this. And if you haven't heard this, but it, you know, I'm sure that many of you listened to This American Life, but back in 2017, they did a story called Past and Perfect. And I would encourage you to go look that up and just listen to you know, how the past really is in the present, even in these museum spaces. One woman tells the story of working at, um, at, at, at Mount Vernon and how really uh, just the residue of the past is so, is so present. Uh, was so present in her experiences there. So Bruce Springsteen, of all people. Here's the nation, here, here, here the nation's museums are key, I think, in helping to us confront these issues. Here the nation's museums are key for they, through the ex exhibitions that they uh, curate, they can help us ad to address the things that for too long we would rather hide, such as racism and its lingering impact on our communities. Additionally, by leading, the, leading in the conversations, our museums stand poised to help us deepen our understanding of, and as my mentor John Hope Franklin once wrote, our interdependence upon one another. And here, I would encourage you, if you have not, to read Stephen Nash's book, Reconstruction's Ragged Edge, which focuses on the reconstruction pro uh, process here in Western North Carolina. And it tells, I think, the story of white allies, people who were allied with people of color and the, the challenges that they even face. And I think that those stories are important for us to represent as well. Without taking up this work, the long-term relevance and thus the survival of our nation's museums, again, large and small, I would argue is in question. In short, as Charlotte Coates, the features editor for an online newsletter, uh, Blah Blop, uh, notes, the nation's changing demographics compels our nation's museums to recognize that people need to see themselves reflected in the programs, the exhibitions, and moreover in the staffs that make up those museums. And this means in some instances of telling stories that we're not, that are always, not always pleasant to hear. With the U.S. Census Bureau projecting that less than 50% of the U.S. population will be white by 2045, why should people from non-white communities want to visit museums that do not adequately address their experiences or interests? Fortunately, events such as this one suggested our museum administrators are that some mu that suggested museum administrators are not shrinking from addressing this and other important questions head on. So I'm going to end there, but I'll go back to um, Avengers Endgame, that scene that I started out with at first. And the reason why I told it, because I think that what is necessary for us to do as we try to address these questions through exhibitions that are in museums, through issues of diversity and inclusion, how we go about this dialogue, I think is really important. I think what is important is that can we find a way that we create a space and a table for everyone to come to the table in a way that we can have a civil dialogue across, across these differences. And I really do believe that museums can play a key role in helping to create that table and that space that we need. So Christy, I'll end there. Hillary, I, and I hope that um, this was something of value. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to just kind of lay out my ideas and my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, for Dr. Waters, please do put them in the chat box. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and uh, we are so grateful for your participation today. Um, I think that we have time uh, for one question before moving um, to the next um, uh, phase of our symposium this morning. A question came in um, that you speak very eloquently about storytelling, which is of course something that we at our museum, but of course museums uh, around the world talk a lot about. And can you reflect on how interpreting objects of art uh, specifically might bring a variety of stories to the fore for discussion and learning? That's a question for me, Hillary. Uh, for you, yes. Okay, that's, you know, um, can you can you give me that question again? I'm sorry. 
sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> um, in terms of storytelling, um, how could we um, talk about, or can you reflect on um, how interpreting artworks might bring um, a variety of stories um, to the forefront for discussion and learning? How one object can present many different types of stories for people to discuss and reflect on? I, you know, I. It's a good question, Neil. Or I'm not. I mean, and Chrissy, I'm not so sure that I can can answer it. Um, and and Willard Willard is here. Willard um, uh, knows that this has been part of the way that the faculty and and I've only been on the periphery of of this conversation and in developing this. Um, Meredith Doster has been at the heart of this work for the Bill Friday Fellowship has been kind of um, incorporating this objects into into um, into this type of engagement that that I think goes to this question. I, you know, it's it's one I'm gonna I think I need to think about that on how to respond to that. I can't respond to that really quickly. Um, but objects do objects do bring forth. I mean, it's like a picture. A picture for me, you know, tells a story. And and there's so many. But people's reaction to the picture may be different from mine. Um, and I think that it's always eye opening to see how different people respond to a particular object. Um, I, even spaces. I mean, Chrissy, I would I was, uh, would even argue space. Because I see the outdoors as a museum in and of itself. I mean, just recently, Willard knows when we brought together the Friday Fellows um, just about two, I think, three weeks ago, we were all in different locations throughout the state of North Carolina because of COVID restrictions. We couldn't bring the entire class together. But we, I was in Rockingham with a group of eight of the fellows. And I couldn't help but think about the, the history of, of Rockingham and Richmond County and knowing that slavery was quite present there and sitting in a space that was looking into the woods and thinking that if these trees could speak what they would actually tell us. Um, so there is something, um, I think, of value uh, of, about how people respond, how you get different responses to to objects and to spaces. So it's, it's a good one. And I'm, I'm sure that that wasn't an adequate answer to that question. But um, if I think of anything else, I'll come back to it again. Well, absolutely. It is, um, it's a very sort of large question that we all um, grapple with here in the museum world. So um, as I mentioned, uh, after the um, students' presentations, we will have a time uh, for Dr. Waters and Hillary to come back and respond to them um, sort of as a whole, but also to uh, have a, a more general question and answer session. So we can definitely come back to that. Darren, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Christy, you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> you got your badge. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Our first student paper will be delivered by Lydia C., an MFA candidate at Western Carolina University in Cullowhee, North Carolina. Lydia's paper is entitled Decolonizing the Archive for Museum Diversity, Engaging Marginalized Narratives Within Collections for Wider Representation in Museums and Archives. Uh, please add questions to the chat box uh, during the presentation. Now, please join me in welcoming Lydia C. Hi. Um, so uh, I um, I'm not great at the somebody else controlling my slides thing. So we'll do as uh, as good as we can. But Chrissy, you can go ahead and bring up um, the first slide. And I've also kind of forgotten what order my slides are in. So we'll, we'll do it as best as we can. Um, and uh, if I forget to ask for a slide to be advanced, you can just advance it. Um, but you look like you're looking for it. So, you know, this is great. Don't start my timer. I'm just gonna start introducing myself while you're finding it. This is wonderful. Um, so I, uh, okay. Let's see. Okay, I'll just go ahead and slowly start introducing myself. And then Sorry, we'll... go ahead, Lydia. I'm, I've almost got it. Okay, great. 
Um, wonderful. I'm trying to rearrange my screen and there. I know it's going to change as soon as you bring the slides up. So we'll do this. Fantastic. You're going to cut all this stuff out, right? All right, so um, I'm Lydia C. I use the she, they, and y'all pronouns. I'm a multidisciplinary practitioner, educator, and curator of art and archives who is passionate about the uses of social justice, of art for social justice and civic engagement. I'm Northern by birth and Appalachian by choice, and I work and live in Western North Carolina. As a serial collaborator, practicing studio artist and educator, I'm a firm believer in the power of cultural access to transform lives. I work in the studio and with community, examining authorship, agency, and representation within the context of material culture. I use photography, fiber, sculpture, and performance in archival processes and gestures of craft. Sometimes my art practice is making things and sometimes my art practice is facilitating connections with people, with stories and communities. And as such, I started Engaging Collections, which is a residency and publication at the intersections of equity with uh, and equity and art with libraries, archives and special collections. And I mention all of this to make clear that I do not identify as an art historian. I am a critical thinker. I'm one who practices making. And I believe in order to be most effective as an agent for change in this liminal and transformative moment, I must both understand the mechanics of how the institution works and as best I can, how the institution fails. For the purposes of this context, the institution includes higher education, archives, special collections and museums, though the larger context of institutions certainly encompasses many more socially and culturally established concepts. I am a queer woman, I am a cultural Jew, I hold white privilege and academic privilege. I am anti-racist, anti-oppressive, and actively engaged in interrogating and dismantling the culture of white supremacy, which pervades nearly every aspect of the institution as well as our daily lives. I look to radical black feminism, critical race theory, social constructions of otherness, and the systems of white supremacy through the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, Mickey Kendall, those referenced in this paper, and of course others to whom I am eternally grateful. I want to paraphrase Ariella Aisha Azule here, whose work on photography, history, and imperialism has been especially transformative to me uh, recently. And um, I listened to a podcast, an interview that she did, and also started reading her book, and I'm just going to paraphrase a few ideas of hers um, to kind of set the tone of some of the things that I just mentioned and move into the rest of this discussion. I came to understand the structural deferral of reparations for slavery was the organizing principle of imperial political regimes as well as the intellectual wealth of universities. The challenge became how not to become imperialism's ambassador and not to normalize the privileged access to these objects offered to scholars and rather recognize others' right to and in them. When approaching an archive for the use of their images in an exhibition and in her upcoming book, Azule was told she could only use the images if accompanied by the archive's images captions. This method of controlling the narrative translated to Azule that the archive was not preventing the images from being shown, but it was the, in the act of Azule showing others, the act of taking something, depriving the archive from being the voice of those images that they are not tolerating that they denied to me. You can go ahead and advance this slide. So once you enter museums and you enter archives and you understand how much was extracted from people all over the world, you understand that the extraction was not invented with photography or with the museum, extraction was already there. And museums and archives were formed as a response to the material burden of extraction. So if the lack of representation within the institution is being interrogated and the pervasive culture of white supremacy is the cause of the lack of representation within public collections, then how do museums, libraries, archives, and special collections begin the process of divesting from the problematic practices which have permitted this reality? 
free admission on Indigenous Peoples Day programming, which supports community story collecting and actively seeking to hire individuals from historically marginalized groups are excellent points of entry into diversifying museums. However, attempting to diversify a museum without due diligence in preparing workplaces, exhibitions, and architectures for engagement by diverse populations can place individuals of color, those who identify as gender non-conforming, women, the differently able, and other historically marginalized bodies at group, uh, and groups at risk of trauma. Uh, next slide, please. Representation matters in museum collections, libraries, archives, special collections, and an extreme lack of representation within exhibits. 85% of artists in US art museums are white and 80% are men, according to a 2019 study, leads, a lack of, leads to a lack of a diversity in attendance and in museum workplace and, and vice versa. Shifts towards greater diversity within collections must occur while the changes in leadership, institutional structures, and stakeholder and community engagement are being implemented simultaneously. This requires acknowledging that whiteness has historically been the default. You can go to the next slide, please. Jasmine Wahi, social justice curator at the Brooklyn Museum, believes that one of the reasons racism is so endemic is because most, not all, institutions were founded to preserve a type of history which is now only now being recon reconciled and recognized as singular and exclusionary. In fact, next slide. Examples of exclusionary practices and racism in collections abound. For instance, the Special Collections Room in Pack Memorial Library, Asheville, North Carolina, was founded primarily by a collection willed by Foster Sondley, who was an avid collector and acquired substantial collections of gems and minerals, Native American artifacts, birds, eggs, and firearms, among many other types of ephemera like manuscripts, maps, pamphlets. Uh, and Sondley donated his collection upon his death under the stipulation that part of the building was to always be used for his collection, plainly marked as the Sondley Reference Library, and only to be used by non-smoking, well-conducted, fit white people men. In recent years, the stewards of this collection, namely Catherine Calhoun Cutshaw and collaborators have pioneered intentional programming to diversify their collection and include legacies of those excluded by Sondley's will. Cutshaw and colleagues scan and digitize images, records, and their relevant historical context offered by Black Asheville residents through the Black Asheville History Projects programming. And these histories are then added to the digital archive and the objects are returned to the, the owners, the families, the stewards of these of these objects. And through these efforts, the volume of records depicting and contextualizing the legacies of residents of color in Asheville in the collection has substantially increased with a goal of expanding from presently almost 5% to 25% of the collection in five years. The Community Archiving Initiative demonstrates an act of intentional decolonialization in direct contrast to the common dominant narratives historically upheld by white supremacy within a formal memory institution. Next slide, please. Um, the scenario of negotiating wills and deeds for public good is far more common than one would like to believe. And, oh, I wanna point out here, um, this caption was written by Carissa Pfeiffer who wrote an essay uh, acknowledging archives after Caswell and references this project as well as many other things. Um, and I am indebted to Carissa for uh, sharing with me the scholarship of Dr. Caswell who is referenced many times in this paper going forward. But I just wanted to nod that this caption is, is that person's and I'm um, grateful to them for this. Um, you can advance the slide, please. So uh, the scenario of negotiating wills and deeds for public good is far more common than one would like to believe. And negotiating around such specific terms is tricky, though with enough funding and support possible. Two very infamous examples of defying the stipulations of a collection specified in a will are the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, where I'm originally from, uh, and the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. The renovation and relocation of these institutions demonstrated that when there's a will, there's often still a way. However, when interrogating items within a collection or in the public sphere, a Confederate monument, for instance, relocation, alteration, or removal is often met with incalculable resistance, stalling the recontextualization indefinitely. And you can advance the slide. Now, I don't mean to draw seamless connections while glossing over many details. And those images that were on the last slide were the original buildings and the, the renovations or, or movement of the barns, in the case of the barns. Um, 
But the issue here is that uh, there are more commonalities between these processes that meets the eye. But the question is, when is it possible to push such changes through? Is it simply a question of money and power, as was the case, uh, in my opinion, of both the Barnes and the Gardener? Are communities who may have historically lacked representation considered whose public is the public good? These questions are also woven deeply into archival collections, particularly within collect conversations around recontextualizing problematic materials, recognizing who and what are missing, seeking omissions and silences, and additionally regarding one's right to remove oneself, one's ancestors, or one's right to be forgotten from an archive or collection. Regarding these archival silences, Dr. Caswell, Dr. Michelle Caswell, um, oh, you can advance. Oh, no, you, no, you're good. We're good. Uh, <laughs> Associate Professor of Archival Studies at UCLA, uh, believes that archivists should be trained from the outset to question bias, ethics, and hierarchy, and the archivist's role in preserving or dismantling these notions. And while you can read this, I'm going to read it too, because I think it's incredibly important. There's a silence that's done on purpose and that needs to be respected. And then there's a silence that's done because of white supremacist attitudes from archivists about what's important to collect. To me, these are two of the major forms of silences, the latter of which needs to be addressed immediately by archivists at all kinds of institutions and all levels. I think we need to shift our notion of what's important from the stuff, the objects, the things, to the people, to the relationships. That's actually what's more important. It's a huge shift for us because we've been so focused as a field on the stuff. The stuff is great, but the stuff is great only in so much as it enables you to tell stories about the people. You can advance the slide, please. So what exactly is an archive? I realize I've been talking about this and while some people understand, uh, many people like myself, I didn't even know what an archive was until my 20s. I didn't know they existed. So this is the National Archives in DC. Uh, you may advance the slide. And the National Archives has a great collection of gifts online for anybody who is uh, searching for um, free usage gifts from the uh, National Archives are fantastic. So um, I will kind of plow through these quickly, but essentially the word archives can be used in many contexts, uh, primarily these three, which is uh, archives written lowercase and sometimes referred to as the singular or in the plural, which is the permanently valuable records, the stuff that Castle was just talking about. And they're kept because they are perceived to have continuing value to the creating agency and to other potential users. And this is the important part of that definition. They are the documentary evidence of past events. They are the facts. They are the facts that we use to interpret and understand history. Next slide, please. Um, and archives, often written with a capital A, usually not always, in the plural, is an organization devoted to preserve, preserving the documentary heritage. So the National Archives and Records Administration. And then next slide, the last uh, term is the word archives is also used to refer to the building itself or the part of the building where these objects are, are stored, the physical, tangible room. Um, next slide, please. So Dr. Caswell believes that, the, that archivists primarily consider archives as collections of materials, collections of records, right? And that we are, that are stewarded across space and time. So what's interesting about this definition is that every single one of these words is contested, which is what she likes about it. Caswell also compares her framework with that of the SAA definitions that I just referenced, presenting that that mindset is old and outdated, focusing too much on materiality and not enough on the less tangible. She says, I think it's important to recognize oral records as records or kinetic records as records. Uh, a dance can be a record. I try to expand the canon of archival theory, which was based on dominant Western ways of being and knowing in the world, to include other ways of being and knowing the world. If this is true, and that archives are in fact the documentary evidence of past events, the facts that we use to interpret and understand history, then examining the role of archivists, curators, those involved with interpretation is essential, as is acknowledging their own biases, lived experience, and context. Um, so museum and library professionals are overwhelmingly white. As of January 2019, um, oh my gosh, 80% of intellectual leadership positions in museums are held by white people, and white people comprise the vast majority of library science degrees awarded in the U.S., 73%. Um, so Actions towards amplifying the narrative as of historically oppressed groups within collections based on current and emerging frameworks is essential and decolonizing the archive and the archivists and museum professionals and curators and those in positions of leadership is a start. 
So what does it mean to truly decolonize an archive? It doesn't mean to knock everything down. You can advance the slide, please. Um, so the Washington Post describes it as a process that institutions undergo to expand the perspectives they portray. The Abbey Museum has a slightly different take that it is sharing authority for the documentation. Um, and these are some common words and phrases used, uh, agency, dignity, representation. Uh, I think Dr. Waters spoke a lot to this earlier. You can advance the slide, please. So in order to fully decolonize an archive, a collection, a museum, a thought process, it must first be acknowledged that the hegemony focusing the lenses through which history has been recorded and contextualized is flawed. But more than this, we must remember that decolonizing does not mean undoing or destroying, but rather dismantling within a reflexive process, reframing around the multiplicity of lived experiences historically omitted from the known histories. So you can advance the slide. So many museums do not have a separate archive, but a collection of ephemera, items and records which are accessioned, processed into the collection as part of objects themselves, art objects themselves. This is the case at the Asheville Art Museum where I'm currently processing the Theodore Dreyer documents from Black Mountain College. Uh, and within the Dreyer collection, I've been able to uncover records referencing lesser known female students, students of color, wives of male faculty who were often overshadowed by their spouses' renown, contextual information about artists who received minimal acclaim during their lifetimes, people of color who were present at the college as staff, uh, who were often left out of the dominant faculty student histories of the college, and many other intersections previously unseen. So while the Dreyer documents merely scratch the surface of these narratives, the records offer indication that much more is waiting beneath the surface and a suggestion of where to dig further. When these materials are ultimately presented in an interactive timeline on the Asheville Art Museum's website, alongside works from the collection and other ephemera, formerly disconnected through lines will provide much needed context, stitching together people, ideas, legacies, and connecting those who might otherwise have been omitted. So through amplification of overlooked narratives within museum collections and archives, expanded engagement becomes a more organic process. Representation has a symbiotic effect on all other areas of museums, libraries, archives, and special collections, including the workplace culture, attendance, community engagement. By looking at historically accepted dominant narratives which populate most collections and considering the stories left out of this hegemony, hegemony, never, accessible and equitable pathways to diversity and inclusion in museums emerge. You can advance to the next slide, but I think that's it. I think it was just, oh, and a wonderful bell hooks quote. Um, and you can pl plow through the rest of these because I don't remember what they are. Uh, and that, and then the last page has my uh, contact information on it, if you wouldn't mind leaving it there. Great. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. If anyone has any questions for Lydia, please do put those in the chat box now. All right. Thank you very much, Lydia. Okay, sorry. All right, our next student presentation uh, will be uh, Megan Flatley. Uh, Megan is a PhD candidate at Tulane University, and her presentation is Diversity Through Engagement, a Community-Driven uh, Exhibition at the Newcomb Art Museum. Uh, as with Lydia, if you have any questions uh, for Megan during her presentation, please add those to the chat box and I will turn it over to you, Megan. Hello. Okay, um, thank you for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be here today um, and to be engaging in a conversation about such a critical topic. Uh, I would like to begin by problematizing slightly the notion of diversity as museums are increasingly coming to understand the situated nature of knowledge and the exclusions that previous museum practices have manifested, it is crucial that we consider what diversity within extant institutions means. And you know, Lydia spoke so eloquently about this just now. Exclusions can stem from the demographics of museum boards and typical audiences, the imperialist origins of most museum collections, as well as the Eurocentricity of the discipline of art history itself. <clears throat> 
if we fully understand this history of art museums and their subsequent coding as spaces for wealthy and often white people, then diversity means bringing more people of color into a space that was not built for them and may in fact be hostile. It is for this reason that I will present an argument that moves beyond diversity towards equity and involves a foundational reconceptualization of ownership and authorship in the museum. It is my view that we must first pursue equity and through this diversity will follow. Uh, slide, please. As a case study in this pursuit of diversity through engagement, I will discuss the 2019 exhibition Persister Incarcerated Women of Louisiana, on which I worked as a research assistant and fellow for community engaged scholarship. This paper will explore how the museum can amplify marginalized voices, serving the community in which it exists in a new equitable way. I present Persister as a model for community engaged museum practices that employ the conceptual language of mutuality, equity, reciprocity, and collaboration. I will show how the Newcomb Art Museum, or NAM, brought in historically excluded community members into a collaborative partnership that had the result of increasing the diversity of visitors and artists, but more importantly, as I argue, increase the diversity of, of those who had a true stake in the exhibition. Slide, please. In order to create Persister, the Newcomb Art Museum had to challenge its conceptions of expertise and move beyond standard notions of what diversity in museums looks like. Rather than merely diversifying the type of art shown or the racial or gender identities of the artists, Persister sought, oh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Persister sought a diversity of creators and authors of the exhibition. Designing an exhibition around the theme of mass incarceration required extensive research and a polyphony of voiced experiences. Two New Orleans organizers and formerly incarcerated women, Dolphinette Martin and Sarita Stibe Martin, were hired as consultants and were involved in almost every stage of the exhibition planning. Director Monica Ramirez Montagu said that together we decided the focus, themes, they were at the table for every single decision. We wanted true self-representation. The museum also partnered with the organization Operation Restoration and over a dozen other local organizations that address the issue of carceral reform. This collaborative partnership proceeded under the presumption that the community partners were the experts. They were the ones best equipped to tell this story. The goal of the museum was to share authorship, to redirect institutional resources, to highlight the often untold stories of women's experience with incarceration. Slide, please. This issue reflects an injustice of critical importance facing the United States and Louisiana and New Orleans in particular. Louisiana has frequently held the title of incarceration capital of the world. Persister centered on women's experience with incarceration because the Newcomb Art Museum is part of the legacy of the Newcomb College, which was the first university in the South to grant degrees to women. The museum frequently presents exhibitions that center women artists and those who are community engaged. Slide please. Despite the fact that the incarceration rate for women has increased 834% over the last 40 years, I will pause for a moment and restate, uh, it has increased 834% over the last 40 years. Women are frequently underrepresented in scholarship and literature on incarceration. Persister offered visitors the opportunity to confront a difficult truth about the frequent inhumanity of our injustice system while foregrounding through art the humanity of the women who have experienced it. Slide, please. Persister presented the personal and intimate stories in their own voices of 30 formerly incarcerated women. Each woman was paired with a visual or musical artist who was commissioned by the museum to create an original work inspired by their story. Four exhibition themes were determined through a collaborative process with community members. They were the root causes of female incarceration, the impact of incarcerating mothers, the physical and behavioral health toll of incarceration, and the challenges and opportunities to re-entry. Once the themes had been determined, the museum conducted, recorded, and transcribed interviews with the persisters. Artist Alison Bionde shot portraits of each woman that were included in the exhibition, along with the audio recordings of the persisters in their own words. This collaborative partnership with consultants who were directly impacted was a critical first step to establishing trust within a community that has been hesitant about institutional engagement. Slide, please. 
The process of the exhibition development promoted collective authorship and authority by ceding decision-making power to community members. Bernadette Lynch has written on the limitations of community outreach when the museum sets the terms of the collaboration. She notes, quote, the aim of the democratic participatory museum must be to practice trust, a radical trust in which the museum cannot control the outcome, end quote. It is also important to note that what we mean by community is a fluid and multifaceted concept. In the context of Persister, Newcomb Art Museum was simultaneously working with and talking about the New Orleans community, the Tulane community, and the community of organizers and formerly incarcerated people. Different aspects of the project appealed to and engaged with these various communities at different times and attempted to avoid a homogenous conception of the word. Slide, please. The museum held frequent brunches throughout the planning process where artists, museum staff, persisters, faculty, and organizers could meet to discuss the progress and challenges of telling the story. The brunches were at times joyful, tearful, uplifting, and sustaining. They continued after the exhibition ended to offer community members the space to reflect on the successes and failures of the show and to begin brainstorming themes and ideas for the next exhibition. The brunches brought community members and museum staff together in purposeful gathering to create community, exchange ideas, and build empathy towards each other's life experiences and differences. At these brunches, persisters were given a portfolio of work by participating artists to choose from based on the artistic style that they preferred. The persisters selected a few artists whose style they liked and then pairings were determined by the museum staff. Slide please. Most artists elected to involve their partner in the making of the work, which brought collaboration into the most primary aspect of the exhibition, the art production. Anastasia Pelias created an oil on canvas painting that measured the height and wingspan of her persister, Sarita Stibe Martin. As she was painting, she listened to music that Ms. Stibe Martin had described listening to while incarcerated. This type of collaborative commission-based art production required an equ equitable contract that would reflect the shared authorship of the persister. This was a novel concept that museum staff had to consider. Working out this new type of artist contract, one that protected the subject of the art, would not have been possible without the consultation of the community partners. Each persister was compensated with a percentage of the value of the artwork they helped create. At the end of the exhibition, the Nuka Museum brought every, bought every work and the show will continue to travel and the proceeds from rental fees will be evenly distributed between the museum, women with a vision and operation restoration. Slide please. NAM also sought to offer opportunities for engagement for other groups as well. A number of Tulane classes were involved in the research or design of the exhibition. Architecture students designed a timeline of the history of mass incarceration in the United States that ran along the floor throughout the exhibition. Slide please. At the end of the path, the timeline came up the wall to form a tree with dates of recent reform legislation from the past five years. Visitors were encouraged to write their own significant events and dates on a leaf that was then hung from the tree. One visitor wrote, June 5th, 2015, makes 10 years that I have been out of federal prison. So thankful and blessed to still be in my right mind and determined to succeed. It was critical for the museum to offer visitors their own opportunities to contribute to the narrative of the exhibition in order to demonstrate an institutional awareness that the museum is not the exclusive authority in regards to this issue. The participatory aspect allowed visitors to insert themselves into the timeline, into the history of incarceration that is so often written without the input of those directly impacted. Slide, please. Another engagement device that the architecture students designed was a message concept that materialized as a sea of floating envelopes. Within turquoise envelopes were notes from currently incarcerated women that answered questions such as, I am a mom and I would like you to know. Slide, please. There were also pink envelopes in which visitors were invited to place their own notes. Museum staff scanned these messages and sent them to the currently incarcerated women who participated in the project as notes of encouragement and solidarity. The comments support the exhibition's mission to build awareness and truly foster community development between those for whom the experience of incarceration is distant and for whom it is all too close. 8,305 visitors attended the exhibition. 
This is nearly double previous attendance for a NAM exhibition with the sole exception of our show Empire that commemorated the 300th anniversary of the city. Slide please. The museum offered more than 30 free programs, including tours, storytelling activities for children, uh, film screenings, educational workshops, and performances. There were lectures and panels that focused on mass incarceration and the law, formerly incarcerated women as advocates, art as a tool for social change, Louisiana policy, and more. The museum hosted 27 school visits and four free family days. The mayor of New Orleans visited, as well as the director of a juvenile facility who brought her staff to the exhibition to do an empathy workshop. Slide, please. Part of the exhibition's aim was to bridge the gap between Tulane as a predominantly white institution and the larger New Orleans community, which is majority black, by bringing visitors into the museum who had maybe never been there before. To this end, the museum ensured that there, were, there was childcare provided at every event and transportation facilitated whenever possible. These measures also offered an opportunity for greater diversity in visitors in terms of class status. There has been discussion of hosting smaller exhibitions at satellite spaces throughout the city going forward, further increasing access. An important element of community engagement for Newcomb and all museums is not just bringing people into these institutional spaces, but also bringing resources and support to meet people where they are. Slide, please. Additionally, the Newcomb Art Museum, as part of its effort to build sustainable relationships with the, com with the community of those impacted by carceral control, has pledged to hold two more exhibitions focusing on the issue of mass incarceration over the next 10 years. Community partners have already made suggestions for the next exhibition to focus on the juvenile punishment system. The museum has further committed to sustaining this project by supporting its travel. The exhibition went first to the Tulane University School of Public Health's Dibble Gallery, and then to the Ford Foundation Gallery in New York, in New York City. After it's showing there, it will move to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Slide, please. This demonstration of commitment to community is vital, in particular for smaller mid-sized museums that can perhaps have a greater impact within community than larger institutions. As a small university affiliated museum with an educational mission, NAM might be less responsible to a board of directors concerned with acquisitions and blockbuster exhibitions. This is not to say that there was not initial trepidation around tackling such a political topic. And there are, of course, museum members who continue to be displeased with NAM's lineup of socially engaged exhibitions. However, the immense support, the immense outpouring of support for Persister, it was named Exhibition of the Year by the Louisiana Endowment of the Humanities, as well as its continued travel, has demonstrated the success of the show in terms of more traditional metrics. It was also, at least in my mind, immensely successful in its goal of facilitating dialogue and raising awareness. I believe it is critical for museums to not shy away from such presumptively controversial themes. Studies have shown that museums rank among the most trusted public institutions worldwide and thus offer space where debate and conflict should be encouraged as functions of civil society. As authoritative but trusted sites, museums can play an important role in facilitating discourse around urgent issues. Persister demonstrated the benefits of community-driven exhibitions to two groups the traditional museum visitor who was previously unaware of this issue and the community of organizers who may have been previously unaware of the impact and power of art to reach people. As museums face calls to decolonize their collections and indeed as their very existence seems to be called into question, institutions desperately need to rethink their engagement with various publics. I have hoped to show an example of community engagement that brought mutual benefit to both the museum and the community of those organizing around the issue of the criminal punishment system. I will conclude with a message that a visitor left for the persisters. You are not alone in there, even though they want you to be. They want you to believe that too, but I know my freedom is bound up in yours. I am with you, we are with you, even though we've been separated. Museums must look beyond the walls of their institution that have falsely separated them from diverse peoples, problems, and our shared social conditions. Echoing Dr. Waters' keynote this morning, I truly believe that museums have a role to play in the struggle for social justice, and that indeed their very survival is bound up in ours. Thank you. And if you could click to the next slide, it has my, uh, my email. Thank you so much, Megan. We did have a question come in uh, for you from Mary Alm. When will the Newcomb Art Museum exhibit be in Myrtle Beach and where will it be in Myrtle Beach? 
as, as I was reading it just now, I realized that it's actually going to be maybe within visiting distance for a number of people on this call. Um, it is, so COVID has, has um, thrown some things into question. It's ending its run in New York. Um, oh, I, believe, I believe in about a month or so. And I'm sorry to say, I don't actually know which institution in Myrtle Beach it will be at, but I will, um, I will contact, um, I will check in about the status via COVID and I will get that information to Christy and hopefully she can pass it on to um, anyone interested. Thank you so much, Megan. I appreciate that. If anyone has any further questions for Megan um, for the Q&A uh, after all of the presentations have finished, please do continue to put those in the chat box and we will return to those questions. Our next graduate student presenter is Virginia Weaver. Uh, Virginia, give me just a second. Virginia is an MA PhD student at um, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And Virginia's presentation is entitled Difficult Transitions, Curating Transsexuality and the Purpose of Uncertainty. Um, as with our previous presenters, if you have any questions uh, for them during the um, presentation, please do add those to the chat box and we will get to them after the uh, presentation that Virginia is about to give us is over. Virginia, take it away. Um, alrighty. Um, I do not have slides, so I'll just launch right in. Um, if, as Toro Moy writes, quote, we cannot determine someone's sex in abstraction from any human situation, end quote, then representation of gender becomes a tricky task. Further, if Moy is correct in asserting that quote, transsexuality shows up the fuzziness at the edges of sexual differences, end quote, then representation of transsexuals, transgender people who seek medical assistance to transition from one sex to another, proves to be still more difficult. Adding to this confusion is the uniformly non-uniform nature of transsexuality, the features and experiences of which vary drastically between each transsexual individual. What is needed then for an approach to transsexual representation in a museum setting, whether art or history, is an approach that mimics its subject matter. When one includes the social degradation and medical experiences of transsexuals, the subject matter falls into the category of knowledge that Vera Frankel refers to as difficult knowledge. Frankel posits that the best way for a museum to approach the representation of difficult knowledge, what cannot be represented by some definitions trauma, is to highlight uncertainty. I hold that an approach that intentionally foregrounds its own uncertainty is essential for the representation of transsexuals in museum spaces. This will become more apparent as I discuss the nature of difficult knowledge, the longstanding difficulties of representing sexed experience, and the ethical responsibilities of museums as preservers and transformers of transsexual art and history. In the past, I have found that issues of representation arise not only in museums, but also in any kind of exhibit, such as those at libraries and in archives, as well as in collections of written or photographic materials. As I wrote this, it was impossible for me to ignore the conspicuously male gaze photographs so frequently added in the middle of older trans memoirs, um, such as Christine Jorgensen's, Renee Richards, and both of Carolyn Cossie's. I have in mind as well the methods of selection in Jonathan Amos' Anthology of Trans Memoirs, Sexual Metamorphosis, how its particular practices of selection and abridgment remain largely un unremarked within it, yet carry a specific line of vision, much like what can easily occur in museum settings. Thus, while this paper does specifically seek to address the curation of museums, it is far from inapplicable to any sort of curation, archiving, or editorial decision-making regarding trans materials, any sort of situation where the public construal of trans lives is at stake. I am primarily addressing the concerns of small to mid-sized museums. While this paper tends to hover in an abstract theoretical mode, I believe in many ways that smaller museums will have an easier time disrupting certainty than a larger museum that has more reason to worry about guiding the visitor. I assume here that the visitor will be able to take in the exhibit's materials in some depth. Um, a larger museum will inevitably struggle in any case like this to not overwhelm the visitor who desires to engage in this method of viewing 
without guiding her very directly, the exact approach that I wish to avoid in my proposal for portraying this difficult knowledge. Portrayal of difficult knowledge, knowledge of what cannot be represented, faces several inherent difficulties. Firstly, of course, representation of what cannot be represented is self-contradictory. No two people, to the extent of my knowledge, experience sex in the same way, let alone transsexuality. And our vocabulary and artistic representation, as well as words, is severely limited in this domain. The second issue is, as Frankel describes, the risk of knowledge, quote, being fashioned into spectacle, end quote. Transsexuality is often made into spectacle, especially male to female transsexuality. This creation of spectacle from lived experience serves to dehumanize the transsexual woman being portrayed, turning her suffering into a shiny show for mass consumption. It's worth noting that Frankel is discussing primarily the examples of genocide and HIV AIDS, but what she says also applies easily to transsexual experiences. Transsexual experiences full of the unrepresentable, the traumas of dysphoria, social abuse, and medical treatment, in addition to the difficulties of representing sex experience in general. To attempt to represent these things, trauma and gender, is inherently impossible to portray in any universal, univocal way. The allure and risk of spectacle is extremely high for these reasons, among others. Thus, transsexual representation in museum spaces faces a double challenge, which grows still more difficult when the fraught nature of curating gender is considered in the broadest sense. Material representations of transsexual lives have been limited almost exclusively to fashion and beauty. Drag shows and ball culture are perhaps the most famous and visible displays of transsexuality, in addition to the heavy emphasis often placed on the beauty of transsexual celebrities such as Christine Jorgensen and Natalie Wynn. Transsexual representation is already spectacle before it even reaches the museum. Edith Mayo points out that, quote, women's exhibits are considered legitimate if they present traditional women's topics such as costume, quilting, or decorative arts. End quote. Mayo is here referring, as far as I can tell, to cis women's exhibits, but the same issue is inevitable in transsexual exhibits. As Mayo further notes, quote, it is not yet widely recognized that women's history is more than simply factoring women into existing traditional models developed for and by men, end quote. Again, this can also speak to transsexual history. Transsexuals can be fit into patriarchal discourse easily as what are colloquially colloquially referred to by the slur traps, or faux women who attempt to sexually deceive men. This is an easy fix to the blurred, or to the issue of blurred lines of sexual differences, and it is one that must be avoided absolutely for obvious reasons. However, Mayo does offer a note of hope. Quote, filtered through the prism of gender, history can be modified, providing a different angle of vision that brings an altered perspective on the world, end quote. Thus, the option to review transsexual history through the transsexual lens itself is opening and beckoning, but it remains to be considered how this lens can reshape representation in the specific space of museum exhibition. If we are to represent what cannot be represented and to avoid creating a totalizing narrative about what cannot be totalized, such as sex and especially transsexual experience, we must imitate the subject with the medium. The medium curated exhibits must follow the uncertainty of transsexual experience itself. Vera Frankel writes a rich description of such an uncertain practice. Quote, difficult knowledge cannot be packaged as if it's a display of finite historic events or objects. It requires art practices and museum structures that allow space and time for difficult knowledge to remain dilemmatic, unresolvable, evoked rather than stated and made present to the imagination through a mix of absence, indirection, and incompleteness that brings the viewer out of passivity." End quote. It is worthwhile to tease out all the aspects of an uncertain practice of curatorship mentioned in this passage. The curator must highlight the infinity of what is being discussed in the exhibit. The selection of material must be self-aware in its incompleteness and, realistically speaking, arbitrariness, and the visitor must be made aware of this as well. The structures of the exhibit must not attempt to resolve the questions it raises. It must not pick sides. It must leave these questions as opened, unresolved dilemmas. 
privileging the implicit open method of evoking, which focuses on affect rather than blatant information delivery, allows for a more personal and embodied experience of the material rather than a guided tour. Perhaps most significantly, the visitor must be guided by herself. Any attempt to establish linearity will disrupt her own experience and is inevitably evidence of the limited positions of the curator. Transsexual experience or transsexual history and experience are hardly linear or simple. Progress is made and lost constantly, both historically and personally. Jay Prosser notes that, quote, autobiography as transsexuality's proffered symptom, end quote. In other words, to be transsexual is to embody a certain kind of narrative in oneself. While an individual transsexual narrative may seem straightforward and linear, various forces restrain what the narrative can say and experience. The history of transsexuality, personal and political, is inevitably tied to incredibly complex, larger forces at play in society. Eric Plemons, for instance, writes on how medical history and its influences from gender theory powerfully affect concrete medical interventions in the changing narratives of transsexual treatment. The works of Prosser and Sheila Jeffries also make much of the histories of psychological sciences in relation to ideas of sex, including ideas of transsexuality, for better and certainly for worse. To attempt to fit these wobbly progressions and regressions into a guided, easily consumed tour would be to distort them. The ideal engagement of the visitor in contemplation, with its shaking up of linearity and certainty, moves toward fulfilling the ultimate responsibility of the museum in representing transsexuals and gender diversity more broadly. I believe that the responsibility of museums is divisible into two aspects, the museum as preserver and the museum as transformative. The public entrusts priceless or unique objects to museums with the idea that these materials will be preserved and used properly. This is what Tristram Besterman refers to as, quote, a fundamental ethic, end quote. But perhaps more importantly, museums are transformative of their visitors. Hilda Hein suggests that museums activate a, quote, chain reaction, end quote, in which visit visitors to the museums are moved by what they see and enact change in the world around them based on this experience. This is not to say that museums should politicize themselves fully as agents of a radical social revolution. Rather, it is to say that any portrayal of a social group will affect the treatment of the group by the public. The issue then would seem to be that a portrayal based on uncertainty could lead to dangerous conclusions. What if a visitor is led to become transphobic by the exhibit's uncertainty? To this, I say that the individual will always reach her own conclusions. There is no guarantee that an exhibit that attempts to portray transsexuals in a very certain light will have any given effect on someone already predisposed to bigotry. The responsibility of the museum to the transsexual is to provoke empathetic thought and questioning. Specific outcomes cannot, cannot be guaranteed or expected. Transsexuals occupy a precarious social position with uncertainty on the streets and under the knife. To attempt to portray this experience in history as anything close to uniform or certain would be irresponsible and inevitably a misrepresentation. In the recent second edition of her book, Transgender History, Susan Stryker writes that while, par while progress in understanding and acceptance of trans lives has seemed to reach a, quote, tipping point, end quote, of inevitability, recent events disclose that, quote, this tipping point is more like a, the fulcrum of a teeter-totter tipping backward as well as forward than like a summit where, after a long upward climb, progress toward legal and social equality starts rolling effortlessly downhill, end quote. Uncertainty in life, inseparably personal and political, must be matched by uncertainty in exhibit. Paradoxically, by making no firm attempt at a singular accuracy, it is possible to be accurate and to be true in denying a unity of truths. Um, I do have a little extra time, so I would like to um, acknowledge that I'm definitely indebted uh, to a fellow student and um, writing center coworker Petra Salazar at UNCG um, for very patiently combing over this with me, um, as well as to uh, Professor Gusain from UNCA um, 
in a class of whose, you know, an early draft of this paper um, was created. So thank you. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, if anyone has any questions for Virginia, please do put them in the chat box. Okay, Virginia, uh, if there are any questions that come in between now and our q and I'll be glad to redirect those to you. Our final presentation um, is from Joel Crothers. Joel is a BA candidate at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, and his presentation is The Importance of Collections in Local Museums. So let me find you, Joel, and ask you to unmute. There you go, and I'll get your slides up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joel from App State. I'm in the Art History Program and uh, minoring in geology and archaeology. My kind of diversity that I tackle with my paper is uh, a little bit different, differently oriented. It's more of a science outreach orientation. And I'll be talking about a case study with a very important museum that I've worked with, uh, at least for my life, here in Boone in the Blowing Rock area that has an amazing diverse collection that's really taught me a lot about the importance of museums. Uh, so if you could do the next slide, please. Mine's a, yeah, there you go. So museums are very important to our country. They contribute every year $50 billion to the economy. Um, there are about 35,000 museums currently in the US and these provide thousands and thousands of jobs. As we've talked about through the symposium, museums are not only repositories of collections, they're cultural capitals and centers for education. So they're immensely important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, diverse collections are the backbones of our major museums in the U.S. Uh, they're um, important for academic reasons and educational reasons, reasons alike. Um, and it's important that smaller museums, mid-sized museums and small communities like here in Boone, North Carolina, where I'm from, it's important that they have similar diverse resources, whether it be in the arts, in history, or in science. Um, so next slide, please. In North Carolina, there are 458 registered museums by the ECHO Project. It's quite a large number for the 100 counties. And most of these are very small. They supply $1.05 billion to the economy every year, and they make up almost 18,000 jobs in the state. So here in North Carolina, we have a lot of these institutions. They're very important. Uh, next slide, please. Some notable examples of small to mid-sized museums that I've been to and have the pleasure of experiencing include the Shield Museum of, Gaston of Natural History in Gastonia, uh, Sika in Winston-Salem, the Brahm Blowing Rock uh, Art and History Museum, which is with us today, and uh, the Moses Cone Manor also in Blowing Rock and the Rinalda House in Winston. These are great mid-sized to small collections. Um, next slide, please. The one I wanna talk about though is a private one right here at Blowing Rock, uh, that's called Docs Rocks Gem Mine. It's a little um, roadside educational geological center. Uh, it's a little gem mining place. And they, uh, they teach about rocks and gemstones. They cut them. It was started by Randy and Trina McCoy in 2007 under um, McCoy Minerals Incorporated. And in uh, the early years, they were sort of frustrated because their love of geology was very much echoed by the incredible geology here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, which is over a billion years old uh, in its makeup. But there was no museum in Blowing Rock to um, reciprocate their love. So they created one. Next slide, please. In 2010, they opened the Appalachian Fossil Museum. Uh, I started working here in 2015 when I was a sophomore in high school. It's the largest private collection of fossils on display in North Carolina, one of the largest geological collections in the whole state. It's not registered by the ECHO Project. And this place has an incredibly diverse collection, which allowed me to share my passion for um, the antiquity of the earth and science and um, paleontology with people when I was in high school and into when I was in college. Next slide, please. A uh, little bit about our collection. We have approximately 1,200 paleontological specimens, 700 genuine minerals. We represent six continents and every major Phanerozoic period. We have 300 taxonomic families represented in this little museum. Uh, next slide. And this is a little bit of our temporal representation. We go all the way back to the Cambrian 
Um, we have most of the, the big Mesozoic funnels represented and uh, this, this awesome rhino here in the corner, that's only about 11,000 years old, which I know it's pretty old, but uh, so we have an, a really, really huge breadth of temporal and also a uh, horizon-based representation here. Uh, next slide. We also have an impressive collection of replicas, which were supplied by a collector and preparator from Tennessee. And we have some very famous species like Tyrannosaurus rex and Tylosaurus. Uh, and these are fun because you get to pick these up and show them to people. So that's an overview of the collection. Next slide. Um, oh, and these are some cool things. This is my favorite here in the middle. This is called a Tolly monster. Nobody knows where this fits in the taxonomic tree of life. We just know it's a symmetrical animal from about 300 million years ago. And we have one here in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> so uh, next slide. These objects are not only cool and not only important in teaching people, they model uh, how a diverse collection should function in a museum because Using these, we can give uh, a condensed history of the entire Earth in this little museum. We offer a variety of personalized tours. We're very affordable. And basically any collection or any question anybody has about this stuff, we can show them. So, I mean, that's what museums do. But it's amazing that this tiny little museum uh, with the site of 321 can offer this. But I think this serves a more important function as well. Next slide. Uh, one, in interacting with all kinds of people, we have a very diverse audience in Blowing Rock because we get people from all over the country, especially the neighboring states here on the East Coast, but also from the rural counties in North Carolina and, um, and other countries. And it's great to have these that you can you could really interact with your tours. And, and the shark tooth here is 50 million years old. It's from the Sahara Desert. And it's one I pass around. This is pre-COVID passing around. Um, and next slide, please. Like I said before, this immense diversity of the people we get uh, from the surrounding areas, we're able to share this with them. A lot of our clientele at the museum are blue collar families from the surrounding areas around Charlotte and Greensboro and Statesville. And a lot of them who I ask um, if they've been to the big museums in Raleigh and in Charlotte, this is their first experience to any natural history museum. And this little, very accessible place um, is their first exposure to the incredible antiquity of life on Earth. And for me as a tour guide there over the years and for people I've worked with, it's always so rewarding when we get to share this with people. Uh, next slide. Now, the museum right now is actually closed. We're renovating and we'll be moving to a new location closer to downtown Blowing Rock uh, later this October. This has been a tough muse uh, year for museums as a, as a whole. This pull from the AAM found that out of 760 institutions, 33% fear closure without additional financial aid in the next 16 months. And yet, despite all this, the Appalachian Fossil Museum and our rigorous uh, health precautions and guidelines, we've been able to stay open the majority of the year and share this incredible resource with our diverse audience. Um, so hopefully in October, we will get to, to open up again and, and share this with people. But this is my little case study of a place that changed my life and got me interested in working for museums and sharing my passion with people and all kinds of people. Uh, next slide. This is from our Facebook site. Uh, so we'll be right near the Tanger outlets. And uh, the last slide, which is next, this is me and my favorite coworker who I love sharing with people. So thank you. <laughs> Um, gonna... Thank you, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was fast. But... I'm clicking all the buttons and nothing happens. <laughs> um, if anybody has any uh, uh, questions for Joel, please put those in the chat box. I have a question come in. I'm definitely a layperson on this, and this is a broad question, but I was curious about your thoughts on how to address issues such as sexism and especially colonialism in the history of paleontology. Joel, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, this is actually, um, I'm kind of in two worlds. I'm kind of the art history world and the paleontological world. I, I volunteer a lot with App State as well. This is something that has come up a lot in recent years, uh, particularly with colonialism, 
For instance, uh, many of the beautiful dinosaur specimens you see in the American Museum of Natural History are from indigenous lands. And there's been a, an effort, especially in the past two years or so, to reconcile with this, that these are from uh, you know, historically Native American lands and to uh, you know, make an effort to acknowledge this. There was a recent paper published this year um, about a, a very famous species called Dilophosaurus, which uh, had a, a whole section in it about kind of an apology to disregarding the, the rights of the, uh, this formation uh, in, in Arizona where it was found to the, the, the people who, who live there, the, the reserve there. Um, as for sexism, there is a, a movement as well to address this. Paleontology is becoming more and more female every year. Um, I think SVP this year, it was a, a record number of uh, female presenters. And this goes as well for LGBTQ plus representation in the, the community. So um, right now, these conversations are in their infancy, but they are being addressed, uh, which is what I'll say. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, I would like to um, invite uh, Dr. Waters and Hillary to rejoin us. And this uh, is a, a time when we can sort of, now that we've heard um, Dr. Waters' uh, keynote presentation, but also uh, heard from the four students, to sort of come back around to this question of the importance of diversity, um, which has been defined, I think, by each of our presenters in different ways, um, in different, in diverse ways. Um, but to, to reflect back on the theme of today's um, symposium, which is diversity in small to mid-sized museums, um, whether they are museums uh, inside or outside, as Dr. Waters said, um, and to, to give Dr. Waters and Hillary an opportunity to uh, respond to the presentations and to sort of coalesce their thoughts about this topic. Hillary, <laughs> I would like to. Who wants to, I, well, I, you know, uh, Christy, I, I'll just say that I enjoyed each of these papers, and I think that um, it's, it was interesting to me to just listen and think that none of us had spoken with each other before um, that we brought together, but there was, there's a common thread that I heard through all of these, these presentations, and there are certain thoughts that just, uh, that I was writing down um, that I thought are important for us to think about. One is, uh, I think it um, it was, it may have been Megan. Megan, I think it was Megan made the point about um, that building trust is extremely important here, in in community engagement. That is is a, an important piece of that is building relationships with people. That um, local museums have to have. Uh, real relationships with the, with the people and the members, the diverse members of a community. And that is not something that can be done overnight. It's something that takes time to actually do. And I think it, it, it really is an important piece of this. Um, Virginia made a point about that I thought was extremely important for us to think about, that museum, museums can play an important role in building empathy. And I think that that's something that is really lacking in our society today. And um, the, the fact that she made that point, uh, I thought was extremely important um, and something for us to think about. Um, so those are a couple of things that, you know, I have a number of things that are here uh, on my paper that I was writing down. And I also thought about archives and how archives are built. And it made me think about a book that I read years ago called Silencing the Past. And even how archives are, uh, Lydia, you, you address this. Um, even how archives are built, we, there is a process of silencing that happens in, in, that, um, in that process. And there's something for us to think about. It's, it's a political exercise to even build an archive. And, and I think we need to be consciously aware of that. So I think that the points that came out of each and every one of these papers were very thought provoking and, and things that um, we really need to engage and think about as we kind of move forward um, in these conversations. 
Hillary? Yeah, I've sort of got a whole little list of takeaways, so to speak, that I, I was making as everyone was presenting. And I suppose, um, you know, these are not conclusive conversations. And I would say that my takeaways are not definitive and, you know, certainly not perfect, but um, that these, I think out of each presentation really came some ideas that are key to this puzzle of how do we sort of move forward? How do we do that um, sort of reflexive which is a good term that Lydia pulled up, um, work that needs to be done in order to move institutions forward. Um, I really feel like um, this idea of sort of expanding stories was really important in every single presentation. Sorry, someone is calling me on my phone right now. Work. Turn that down. Um, and sort of looking at how within Lydia's, it's looking at these, who is who is making, you know, these archives and who are they representing, where are they being held, um, or as um, Megan really pointed out that there is this bringing together of individuals, that there is this partnership, um, looking at really salient topics specific to a community, um, but also one thing that I think that project, the really comes forth is that um, these topics may seem very specific to communities that you're immediately working with and yet there is a relevance and a resonance that goes far beyond and I think the touring of that exhibition from the Newcomb Art Museum really sort of brings that home. Um, in Virginia I really appreciated uh, this idea of embracing incompleteness um, or the uncertain because that is not necessarily something problematic but productive and um, can actually be informative. I think that the inclination institutionally is always to try and like tell the story, to have everything that's necessary and that that's not always sort of the best approach, right? That there needs to be this greater malleability uh, and breaking down of traditional structures within the field in order to build up again something new. Um, and then Joel, I really appreciated the perspective of coming from a natural history um, side of things and um, a very interesting thought and in how I think a lot of what we're talking about or comes to mind first is this idea that we're dealing with very recent things and yet museums and um, history centers and all of that deal with things going back a hundred, a thousand, a million years and that these um, topics that seem very prevalent in the now are also very applicable across our very long history on this, you know, of this, of this planet basically. Um, but yeah, just really appreciating sort of the the interdisciplinary nature of what each of you have brought to the table and that's something that I think is truly in the spirit of the the project the loose project and also to the spirit of what is necessary in order for um, important change to happen in many ways is that there is no siloed uniform perspective that's going to cause that change and that inclusivity and all of these sort of words that are always under conversation and discussion these days and that um, it takes many perspectives in order to sort of reform and move things forward and so I'm really appreciative of um, the unique nature of each of these presentations where there were also many shared ideas brought forth. Thank you, Hillary and Dr. Waters. I do um, want now to um, bring up some of those questions or come back to some of those questions that came up um, over the course of the symposium so far this morning. And one of them is directed uh, to you, Dr. Waters. And give me a second, I'm going to switch my screen. Okay, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, technology, so many things. All right. Okay. Um, so the question was, uh, Dr. Waters, um, could you respond uh, to the Kehinde Wiley sculpture at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts? Um, this sculpture uh, is part of the larger body of work of K Kehinde Wiley in which he um, presents uh, African-American at sort of typical everyday African-Americans from all walks of life um, in these sort of um, grand 
scale artworks uh, responding to the history of art in order to challenge um, representations of African Americans in art uh, and cult, uh, popular culture. Um, and this particular sculpture, of course, in Richmond, Virginia, um, is a part of a larger history of um, public art in Richmond that celebrates, um, I guess, uh, Confederate um, people of note. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, while those were being uh, removed um, by folks uh, this summer, um, this uh, sculpture was actually uh, coming to Richmond um, to uh, Monument Avenue um, after those were being torn down, this one was being brought home, if you will. It debuted mm -hmm. in New York City and then was permanently installed um, in Richmond, I believe, either late this spring or early this summer. So the question to you was, can you respond uh, to that, uh, either Kahindi Wiley's art in general um, or as sort of the place or, or retelling or rethinking public monuments? Um. Yeah, Chris, this is this is an interesting it's an interesting question. I'm familiar with this artist's work. I saw some of it when it was some of his work when it was um, a part of an exhibit at the uh, North Carolina Art Museum in Raleigh. Um, I think, and I think there was some that was uh, at least a couple of his paintings were also a couple of the paintings were included in an exhibit that was here in Asheville at a private, muse, uh, private art museum um, not too long ago. I, it, it really forces you to kind of think and really engage the, the figures in a very different way. It, it, you know, I don't know, I'm not enough of an expert on art to, um, to really respond to this question, I think in a very deep way that's gonna, in a way that's gonna be satisfying. I think it's just an interesting juxtaposition. It, it really does force you to kind of rethink how we, how you see in this case, African-American figures. Um, so, it, you know, I'm not, I didn't follow the installation of this particular piece in, in Richmond um, uh, when it was being done. I'd like to go back and actually look and see what the response to this was. Um, but I think it's very interesting work. And I think that um, it's very thought provoking. And I think that that's what art is supposed to do. Art and sculpture is supposed to force you to think. And I think that um, these pieces and his work really does that in a very vivid way. Yeah, and especially because you had shown us during your presentation the sculpture, uh, the Roosevelt sculpture outside mm -hmm. of the um, National Museum of American History. Um, sorry, the Ameri Museum of yeah, American History. Natural History, that's right. Natural <laughs> History, thank mm -hmm. you, in New York City. Um, and, you know, the I'm really fascinated by this idea of the things that we learn um, through looking at public mm -hmm. art um, and sort of that idea. And Hillary, feel free to jump in here. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to exclude you. The, the question was originally um, directed to Dr. Waters, but please feel free if you have thoughts or anything to add to that particular question or conversation. And I did change the, the slide just a little bit so that you could see um, the sculpture itself in greater From detail. Different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, and you know, of course, do we have certain in our mind because of our history, we, it, we, we tend to see certain people and certain groups of people a, a certain way. And I think Megan addressed this when she was talking about even how we think about people who have been in, who have uh, been incarcerated. There, there is an, an attitude that, that I think um, is that we, bring to the table simply by knowing that fact alone in any way that can challenge that. I mean, I saw that in my previous life when I worked as work with the Department of Corrections for North Carolina as a probation parole officer, that there's a certain attitude that we have of, of, of people who are trapped in that, in that, in that's what I call is just, um, 
you know, I'm, the word word here escapes me, but it, it, you get trapped in this process or in this system, and then you're seen by society a certain way. Um, but anything that can challenge that and unravel it so that we can get to seeing a person's humanity, I think is, is important. And this artwork for me does that. It does that, and it, it forces you to, to rethink how you see African-Americans. Um, and so I think it's, it's important very important uh, artwork. Yeah. Thank you. Hillary, do you have anything to add before we move on? No, okay. Another question that came in uh, also for you, uh, Dr. Waters. I know it's a large question, but I was curious if you have any thoughts on why the United States and some other nations like Poland, for example, might have more resistance to examining their past than some other nations do. Mm -hmm. You know, Virginia and I were um, having an exchange uh, privately on, on this one, and I suggested a text um, that that you, Virginia, you may find interesting. Um, it has been a book that I have been, that has challenged me greatly. Um, it's entitled In Praise or Forgetting. And so... It, you know, it looks at this process. I mean, there there have been other places like Northern Ireland that has had a very difficult time moving through the these histories that they that they have had. But the United States, I can only speak to the United States. I think it has a lot to do with what I said in um, in my presentation about our attitude, this desire to to see ourselves as triumphant. I would also suggest reading James Baldwin. James Baldwin, I think, challenges us here a lot. And his book, Giovanni's Room, is one of the best books. There, there's this uh, soliloquy. I see Lydia. She, you, you're familiar <laughs> with this book. You should chime in here too if you want to. But there is this. Um, there, there's this scene where the American is talking to a, a Frenchman and and they're, they're talking about time and the French uh, bartender responds by saying, you know, Americans no concept of time, that no concept of the past or even the future. We think mostly about the present. And in a way that I, I think that um, Baldwin is really echoing Alexis de Tocqueville's um, here in, in in his work and his what he says in Democracy in America about Americans, that we're we're um, we're disinclined to think about the past, and we hardly ever think about the future because only th the only thing that matters to us as Americans is really what is happening at the present moment. This is what we think about, and I think James Baldwin addresses that in that book, Giovanni's Room, where he says Americans, you know, act like time is some triumphant parade that is constantly in motion and we do uh, so and so I think that we want to as who was it George Brancroft saying we want to see ourselves as born essentially perfect and then beginning this progress this process of becoming more perfect so we don't want to see ourselves as making having made any mistakes so that means you marginalize those stories that says okay that challenges that narrative and I think that that, that it's a political it's it's a political process so that's how I would respond to that, Virginia, if that helps. But I think that if you read that book, and and even Megan, I think, no, Lydia, going back to your presentation on archiving, um, two good books here would be that book, Silent, In Praise or Forgetting, and then the other one would be, um, uh, oh, what is it, Silencing the Past, which talks about this archival process and what we do to silence certain voices in the historical narrative. Thank you, Dr. Waters. Mm -hmm. uh, Lydia, you wanted to pose a question to each of the panelists and feel free, uh, I've uh, made it so that each of you can mute and unmute yourselves. Hi, um, well, so I, I think that the previous question kind of led into this and it's a big question and y'all don't all have to respond, but I'm, I'm particularly curious because um, I think each of us uh, described othering in our in our presentation, right? And um, particularly, you know, we're talking about gender, we're talking about race. Um, Joel, I really appreciate that you brought up the class othering uh, within your institution and how um, your visitors are of a particular, generally like overwhelmingly the representation of your visitors is kind of different than um, what we see in a lot of uh, 
urban centered art institutions, right? And, um, and this is tough, but um, I wanna bring up the fact that, or the question of who's in this room right now, because uh, mm -hmm. we are all having these conversations about othering within collections, within archives, uh, within institutions, and yet we are all um, sitting in a room that seems to be comprised of individuals with overwhelming academic privilege. And so what does it mean for us uh, to be having these conversations, the 22 of us who are here? Um, and, and I think Megan, you spoke to this uh, very tenderly in your presentation about the, the care within which trust has to be built to meet people where they are, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than expecting people to come to us in white cubes between glass doors and all of the processes required of becoming part of something rather than the excluded other. Um, so I know that's a really big question, but I would love to hear if, if each of the four of y'all wanted to maybe share a little bit about that or your thoughts. Um, <laughs> Does anyone mind if I go first, just while it's fresh on my mind? Um, go ahead. I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember verbal things like well at all. So, um, part of the reason that I discussed um, the applicability of um, discussions of curatorship of museums to other media is that there are a couple resources that I'd like to highlight as examples um, of. A kind of democratizing uh, force of curatorship. Um, one is um, Laboria Cubonics's website, and that's a feminist collective that's um, super influential um, on resurgences of major past theoretical schools um, of radical feminism as well as cyber feminism in a very inclusive and um, intersectional way. And their website provides their manifesto for free in various formats and as well as other resources and definitions of terms and um, reading guides and their their ideas have you can see them across twitter and so on if you're in these spheres um, in fact i more rarely see them discussed among academics than among um, people with more affective reasons to engage with it um, another one is the folger shakespeare library website um, that features a lot of materials, both for teachers as well as readers from a student level um, all the way up to academics in various media. Um, and then <laughs> the Vagina Museum in the UK is, it's a museum that has a physical location, but it is also a website that provides tools specifically for educators, as well as a podcast that talks about scholarly topics of history, as well as like information that can be helpful to the lay person. Um, and mm -hmm. so it would have been helpful to clarify that in my paper, but that is definitely something that I think about um, as well as basically just attracting interest as a matter of accessibility. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, Joel, Megan, or Dr. Waters, so either one of you or do any of you want to uh, take up the question? Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll speak if that's okay. Um, this is where uh, my experience both with this museum and also App State um, or outreach becomes really important, I think, because um, with a lot of these centers, whether it be in the arts or the sciences or history, uh, it is often hard to, um, you know, get people to just sort of come in to, you know, people who aren't in these spheres, who aren't familiar with this stuff. And I think this is where you know, whether it be public events, advocation of this is important. And this is one of the, the virtues of the little place I worked at was it, it was so unassuming. It was this little place literally by the side of the road and people didn't expect to get this natural history experience in there. Um, it's, it's a, it's a hard, yeah. I mean, that's a, a really relevant subject you brought up is, uh, is, this kind of outreach-based mindset. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'll say. It's important. <laughs> that's kind of the best I can put it. It is. 
Joel, Joel, you're right. I agree, um, Lydia. I, I think you're working with um, with the Z Smith Reynolds Foundation, and I think that they are they're they're leading here. I think because that project that I was involved with, the Public Arts Project. Um, I mean, they were extremely intentional about how uh, that work was um, was uh, was developed. They were intentional about the diversity of that of of the committee that was selected to do the um, the work of uh, choosing those art projects that would would be funded in this first round. I mean, it was it was work. I, I thought that I have never been in a room with a more diverse group of people ever. I really have not. From background, racial background, from what people did, their ex their, their area of expertise. And while it was a long process, it, it turned out to be an extremely rewarding process at the end of the day. Um, and and it demonstrated, you know, this is how democracy works, to have these voices around the table and then to take the time, again, this relationship building and this outreach to bring more diverse audiences into museum is really going to take time. And we, and, and again, I will go back to, I know that I sound like a broken record to a number of people because I'm constantly referencing Alexis de Tocqueville's work, but I think it is really the textbook of America. If we want to understand ourselves as Americans, read, read democracy in America. I mean, it takes someone from the outside to come in and really shine that light uh, for us to, for people to be able to see how they really are. And we are people who are impatient with time. We want things to happen very quickly, but this is a process that will not happen quickly. And also one of the points that I think I made in, in my presentation was it's not just about the programming. It's not about having diverse programming or diverse, uh, diverse exhibits, but it's about the staff too, the people who work in the institutions. And, um, and that's a real challenge, I know, for many, uh, many organizations here in the Asheville area, because we're not that diverse a community as it is uh, already, but these are, and, and I see the Pam put it in, in diverse trustees. I mean, from the leadership on down, it has to, we have to do it there. And I, I think, and this is the reason why, Lydia, I referenced uh, Z. Smith Reynolds. I think that they did it in a way that was extremely intentional. They they not only verbalized that this was what they wanted to do, they went out and did the hard work to build a, a very diverse team for that particular project. And it took time to do it. So I, that, that would be what I would offer here. Megan, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I guess I would just say um, in regards to Lydia's specific question about academic privilege, um, I think the way that I conceive of it is that it is something that I leverage um, and this is part and this only works um, in tandem with my engagement with communities or with um, social movement struggles outside of my role as an academic. So um, and I, I I, I was a fellow for community engaged scholarship um, through the Mellon Foundation. So I try to integrate um, community voices into my scholarship itself, but I also try to balance that um, it, with my own personal um, political role, um, for instance, in, in the abolition of the prison industrial complex. Um, so I think that the issue of academic privilege is, is a much um, firmer barrier when academics don't also have this kind of foot in the real world, for lack of a better term. Um, so I, and there also is a benefit, I think, to, um, because I, you know, I, I, I think a lot about, about art museums and as, as bastions of of white supremacy, and I, I ask myself a lot how reformable these institutions are. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I think I view uh, myself as a as a kind of parasite that can, through this academic privilege, right, infiltrate these institutions and and redirect resources and and kind of use this institutional um, privilege uh, to redirect resources to redirect attention while also participating in a broader struggle to to change these institutions, which I, um, 
acknowledge, you know, takes, I think, pretty, pretty radical um, revolutionary efforts. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a bit of both. Um, and I think um, maintaining accountability to people outside of academia is crucial and having organizations, um, organizers, people that you're, that you're working with, um, who can kind of hold you accountable and, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Megan, I just, I want to tell you that I'm totally adding Parasite to my business card. Because <laughs> so, I really hate that phrasing, it's fantastic. That comes from um, the language around social practice art. Um, so actually my advisor writes about social practice artists um, as parasites in, in that way. So I can't take credit for that phrase. <laughs> Thank and, you. you know, and Christy, if I can just say, because I of saw course. Pam Pam put a comment in, in the chat about, um, and I would agree with her, there was real intentionality around how you all put together the, the loose committee to re examine to go through the catalog and to make recommendations about how the permanent exhibit was um, was reinstalled and I think and I want I mean I want to give you all um, some you know your props there for the work that you all are doing to to kind of bring this this conversation to the foreground so Pam I, I agree there was great intentionality in, in the work that you all did and how you put this together. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Waters. Uh, it's a perfect segue um, to uh, Hillary is going to rejoin us and do a wrap up um, for this morning's symposium. The time has flown by. I can't believe that we're almost out of time, but she uh, wanted to wrap up by talking just about what you just brought up, Dr. Waters and Pam. Thank you. Yeah, um, first of all, on behalf of everyone here at the museum, thank you to our presenters and attendees today. I know that I have a couple of colleagues who are working today that are really looking forward to um, checking in on what was discussed here today. And I think that this is a great you know, example of sort of trying to do a little bit of listening on our parts. I think that's a huge part of everybody's work when it comes to um, conversations around diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, and inclusion is that act of listening. Um, the proceedings from today will be made available online. I believe everyone's papers and um, the recording will be available online. So you can revisit these awesome um, thoughts and um, ideas put forth today. I really appreciate a lot of the ideas that have been put forth because um, as Pam is noting in the um, comments here, every museum, large or small, has a different history and challenges to be addressed. It is exciting, Pam, I agree. It's hard work, it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, but exciting. Um, the museum really focuses on art of the you know, 20th and 21st century in the United States um, across the board, but also has a sub-focus on the region here in Western North Carolina. North Carolina and Appalachia, and I think that today's presentations really touch on how these things are relevant in our immediate communities, but also more broadly. Um, our upcoming publication does deal with some of these questions around Western North Carolina and Appalachia and how it has been um, presented and perceived over the years, and we try to do a little bit of work in the catalog as well as in the exhibition at Intersections in American Art to um, dismantle some of those things and challenge some of those things. And I mean, here at the museum, we actively acknowledge our location on ancestral Cherokee lands and our vicinity to the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians and the Koala Boundary nearby. Um, and you know, acknowledging that we are actively expanding on what we have started with the loose project to increase diversity and representation within the objects in our collection and the artists represented in the collection, um, assessing our internal practices, including staff, trustees, as Pam pointed out, our collection itself, our partners and our stakeholders, um, looking carefully at exhibition and public programming and trying to move towards these action plans, right? So many of the great things that y'all put forth that are things that are making a difference and making a change. Um, within institutions and the way that we function. So having that sense of action and forward movement, um, we can talk about things all day, but the doing is where it really happens. Um, and really, you know, moving towards trying to become a more effective and reflective center of community, which I think is really what small to mid-sized museums offer in a unique way that large institutions cannot, that we can be so responsive to those who live immediately around us and serve them. Um, you know, I think, 
one of the big things that I've really taken away both from working on the Loose project and from our conversation today is that museums have and institutions that sort of cultural institutions, be they science centers, aquariums, whatever, that we really have a, a role and a duty to expand stories, to expand the idea of what institutions hold and collect and present, and to expand who the stories come from and who they're speaking to. Um, Dr. Waters acknowledged that this is often a slow process, um, and hopefully it will sort of pick up speed. Institutions are slow to change, but um, there is much work to be done and what I have really gotten a sense of from the presentations offered here today that that work is obviously being done um, and I thank you all for your contributions to this ongoing conversation and um, look forward to keeping up with how these conversations evolve. Um, and yes, Pam has pointed out that if you want to know more about what's going on, the Ford Foundation, uh, which has supported uh, the Her Sister exhibition, where that's being shown right now, has some really amazing resources. And to bring it back around to the Henry Luce Foundation, um, they are an incredible supporter of this work in institutions of a variety of sizes and focuses. And so be sure to check out those resources. Um, we're thankful to the Henry Luce Foundation for supporting the catalog, the exhibition, and this very wonderful set of conversations today. Thank you, Hillary. As Hillary mentioned, a recording of today's program will be uploaded to the museum museum's website within the next day or so. And I'd say probably within the next month, four to six weeks, uh, the proceedings uh, from today's uh, symposium will also be published to the museum's website. Um, once those proceedings are published, I will uh, email out to everyone who joined us today that they are available, um, but they will be available sort of forever along with a recording on the museum's website. Thank you again to the Luce Foundation, Dr. Waters, the student speakers, Pam, Hillary, and all of you for joining us today. Take care.